presentation. So our next session is uh, the astrodynamic session, which is the most awesome session in this conference. <laughs> I'm not biased at all when I say that. Uh, and for our first presenter, we have uh, Troy Bennett, and he's going to talk to us about space-to-space -space based relative motion. So Troy, uh, Trevor Bennett, sorry, is a PhD student studying under Dr. Hans Peter Schaub at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He completed his undergraduate studies at Texas A&M University in 2012 and has work experience in both government and private sectors. As a NASA Space Technology Research Fellow, his current research efforts focus on charge astrodynamics and formation flying, and it's really exciting stuff. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Trevor Bennett, and I'll be talking to you guys today about space-to-space-based relative uh, motion estimation using linearized relative orbit elements. So we're going to kind of discuss all the different aspects of this title here as we go through this, uh, this discussion. So let's begin first with relative motion estimation. Why, why is this important? I mean, there are conventional things like rendezvous and docking, um, and even some newer concepts from DARPA, like fractionated satellites. In all these cases, the relative position, relative orientation, become increasingly important as we you know, close in. There are also other applications, as we you know, are well informed at this conference, the space situational awareness side, or the orbital debris problem. You know, both of these, there's large populations there. Can we actually go ahead and grab information about these? And what relative motion estimation poses is that we could actually, rather than using ground-based measurements or even other measurement types, we could try and send a satellite up observer up there and then estimate all the positions of these satellites or debris objects relative to our observers. In that case, that's where SSA becomes a space-to-space -space based uh, observation platform, is we can start targeting these things. And as well as enabling other technologies like electrostatic detumble, which is some of my other work, but in general, we can do active debris removal once we have this space-to-space-based -base, space -space -based estimation. We now have all the relative motion information to do this. So what kind of the, the, the objective of this talk, anyway, is to enable this satellite-to-target tracking, and we're going to use a new state vector called linearized relative orbit elements, and I'll kind of get into those as we go further. So one of the things that we're going to use in this talk is angles-only navigation, right? And so we have our, our target object and our imager or chief and we can capture you know, our relative bearings to this, to this target object. Now, why angles only? Well, this is a challenging um, choice of measurements, and it's, of course, not fully observable for, many, or for cases. And so what it pro or provides for us is a great demonstration of what these linearized relative orbit elements can do and what we can do in terms of relative motion estimation. And the reason it's not observable we can look at some example cases here. So this one is a scaled ellipses case. You have two relative motion ellipses around your observer, and whether it's on the true path, which is that inner ellipse, or a ghost path, which kind of goes around it, you get the same angular profile. And unfortunately, that means that you can't discern between these two member, or these two member ellipses, right? A similar example would be along the V-bar, if it's a leader follower position. Again, you can see that it's ahead of you, but you don't necessarily know how far just using angles only. And then there are, of course, other examples like co-elliptic, where you have them drifting by you. The thing is, even though we can't discern between the different members of these particular categories, we can actually determine which family these estimates belong to. As you can see, the angular profile from the ellipse is going to be very different from the angular profile of the V-bar. And so we're going to kind of capitalize on the difference between these families of relative orbits. So some quick formation flying definitions. Uh, again, we're going to start off with just defining this relative motion as the inertial difference between our target object or deputy and our chief or observer. And this is, we're going to define this in a uh, Cartesian frame, the Hill frame, in which it's centered on that chief satellite. Now, there are a lot of solutions to this problem. And with a careful use of assumptions, you can kind of whittle it down to a variety of different uh, choices, what we've actually chosen is the clohesse wilshire equations. And so what these provide is a time evolution of x, y, z, lowercase, which is the relative motion states, uh, as a function of six invariants. So you can see in that equation there, there's like an a-naught term, an alpha term, uh, offsets. What that does is it prescribes these ellipses. It prescribes the v-bar. And if we use those, then, then that becomes our new state vector. So 
the problem with these CW equations is there's a singularity in there for certain configurations. So if we think about that V bar case, that A naught term, if it were zero, then our alpha term would be ambiguous, right? It could be anything. And that poses a real problem for estimation if you have terms that can be anything and still have the same result. So we're gonna reformulate this before we go any further into the estimation. And the way we do that is we pose this trigonometric expansion of the previously defined clovesi wilshire equations and define two new terms, this A1 and A2. And what that gives us then is a new form, which we're gonna define as the linearized relative orbit elements set where our state vector is this A1, A2, B1, B2, X offset and Y offset. And as you can see, if we know these invariants, we can plug them in at any point in time and obtain where our XYZ state is. And then from there, we can also say, this is now where that, uh, that target object is relative to our observer. And if we know our observer well, we now have some great information about this target object that we have interest in. So the other thing we can do is at any point in time also back out. This is part of the uh, estimation development. We have this inverse mapping where we can take our Cartesian state that we're familiar with and bring it into these invariant sets. Uh, but what you can, you can imagine is that these clohesi wilshire equations, these invariants or constants were not meant to vary, right? And in estimation, when we start putting additional perturbations, let's say like SRP or drag terms, we wanna be able to evolve the state with these you know, perturbation forces. So what we're gonna do with these perturbation forces is include them using a Lagrange brackets approach. So the development of uh, like Gauss's variational equations, we can actually then map any acceleration to a time varying value for these invariants. So for our estimation state, we can now include any kind of perturbation forces and track that well. So it still poses the question with state observability and, a forma and of course our filter formulation. So let's go a little bit more into our state observability. So in our, estimate, our linear time varying systems, we can use this observability matrix, uh, Gramian, which is this H transpose H. Uh, and as we discussed, the angles only are not fully observable. And that's because if we think back to that ellipse case, the scale of that ellipse is not known, right? We know that it's in the family of ellipses, but the size is still uh, something that we can't capture. And so if we consider these non-singular CW equations that we just kind of morphed into, we can actually make these non-dimensional, kind of remove the scale factor from them. So in this case, we're gonna take the A1 parameter, which is kind of the size of that ellipse, and non-dimensionalize all the other coefficients in there. And in doing so, we now have non-dimensional XYZ states over time that can evolve and be fully observable, right? The challenge is that we see uh, this A1 term, right? We're dividing out by one of the, these constants. And so we have to be careful with our selection to make sure that we're not making this uh, a divide by zero case. But without loss of generality, we can always take one of these coefficients, because one of them will be non-zero for relative motion, and divide the rest out and have a great form, uh, filter formulation. So with that, our relative orbit shape estimate can be fully observable with these non-dimensionalized LRO estimates. And that's because we're going down to five states as opposed to the full six, and we're just saying we don't know the scale factor, and that's only because of angles only, right? If we include additional measurement types like a range measurement, we can use this full state and capture the full geometry, but this is where this method starts to uh, separate itself from other ones, is that we can still capture shape without, with just angles only, but at some point we'll need that size scale factor to be able to bring it into the, the full uh, relative motion. So with our uh, estimation, we're gonna go ahead and use an EKF formulation. We've got our typical state propagation and we can put in additional noise in there to help uh, perturb it towards the right answer. We're gonna use bearing measurements. This is just azimuth and elevation as defined in that hill frame, which is where the CW equations are defined. And we can insert then our L row equations into where you see X, Y, and Z here. Then with our measurement noise, we can also include a Gauss-Markov process for a camera. We're also gonna include white noise, and that white noise is a function of your camera properties. So what I've defined here is that if you have a camera of so many megapixels and you have so much error per, uh, per pixel and a field of view alpha, then you can actually get your noise and it becomes some more of a general application for, for your relative motion estimation. And then of course our Gauss-Markov process allows that uh, to, to be a complete measurement equation. 
And then with that, we also have our, our typical covariance time update. We're uh, going to also include some process noise in there to inflate it so that we can listen to our measurements. And then we're going to use a uh, Joseph formulation for our uh, update there. And these are the parameters that we have control over. So as you design your own filter around these L rows, you can use these to kind of tune it for your particular needs. So let's, let's introduce a, an example case here. So this is using the full state. And as we said, it's not going to be fully observable, but it gives us a good basis to look at the non-dimensional set. Um, this is a 2 to 1 ellipse that is drifting with some offset. And so the nice convenient thing about these L rows is it gives you the easy geometry. So you can see that A1 is 100 and, and B1 is 200. So that gives you that out of plane in the bottom left corner, but it also gives you that nice drifting ellipse, as you can see in the top left corner. And then we're going to go ahead and throw some error onto that so that we can see if we can actually estimate the case here. Right? And this is what our initial covariance is. It's at the limit of the val validity of our CW equations. And then we've included process noise of this magnitude. So this is somewhat deceiving here, but this is our, our answer for this case. And with this geometry, you still see it kind of collapse. You get something close. But again, remember that it started in the linear area and still remains so. You can kind of look in the A1 and A2 uh, components there on the left. So those are, uh, I'm sorry, B A1 and B1, those are the shape and both in the plane and out of plane of that ellipse. And you can see that it's kind of flatlined, and then you can also see a lot of jitter in other ones. Again, without, with this angles only, it's ambiguous, and so you can have an infinite number of these shapes within the same family, and so that's why you're just seeing this jitter all over. So, Again, we have this drifting estimate that just kind of moves through, and it's not fully observable, so it's deceiving in this convergence-like behavior. But now let's look at that non-dimensionalized set. So we've gone down to five parameters. We've non-dimensionalized by A1. We're using the same initial conditions and the same error, but as you can see, they've been non-dimensionalized by 100, so it's you know, two orders of magnitude less. We still get the same relative motion for our truth, and our covariance then and process noise are then also scaled by that. And so this is what we're starting to see now. We actually can reduce the error, and this has been redimensionalized if we had known A1. We could see that we're getting almost millimeter to you know, sub-millimeter level accuracy within the first orbit, right? And then even the convergence itself is very, very quick within the first you know, quarter orbit. And that's because this estimate allows us to estimate the shape without knowledge of, you know, of range and potentially get full you know, state estimation from there. So this is fully observable using this non-dimensionalized set. Um, it's also a really powerful set using L rows, which is a geometry-based estimation rather than just using XYZ time-evolving states. And of course, we can also put in perturbations as we go forward. And so with that, this we have shown is that we have a new kind of filter approach using a different parameterization of the CW equations using invariance rather than trying to use a time evolving state. We can still include perturbations and we get shape rather quickly. So if you're looking to do kind of on orbit estimation, like we've seen some proposed um, concepts here, you can do all of that. Also, uh, the, this L row formulation can use a variety of orbit configurations. It's very general, as long as you're still within the validity of the CW equations. Uh, but there's potential for extension of that as well. And that extension uh, comes in the, the order of kind of some of our future work. There's a set like curvilinear coordinates that also capitalizes on these same kind of CW equations, but gets rid of some of the linearization. That's a, an opportunity here, as well as uh, epic state. The advantage of these L rows is they're defined at a particular point in time you can choose that point in time at your will. So if you decided that a, a certain point in that orbit is more observable than another for you, or you'd like to capture a snapshot of it, you get to choose when that epoch is. You don't necessarily have to uh, start at a you know, prescribed point. And then we can also c consider additional measurement types, but seeing its uh, performance here with just angles only is pr quite promising and, and demonstrates the applicability of this. And with that, I'd like to thank the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship for their contributions to this work, and I will open up the floor to any questions you may have. Thank you. So we have time for, say, one quick question so we can try to catch up here. If there's no, if there's no questions, then I guess uh, I'll have a question uh, for you. Um, Usually people say that these systems are unobservable, um, but 
is it a better statement to say that they're weakly observable or it, it kind of is case dependent or what, what are your views on, on, on the observability? Well, without that scale factor, we can't discern between the members of the family. So we, we can get the family like the ellipses or that it's a leader follower, but yeah, other than that, we can't, can't discern between the two without moving to something more nonlinear or, right, which is what, if you're looking at the curvilinear coordinates where you can start looking at over the horizon or arcs, then you start getting toward like weak observability. So. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Everybody up here is going to get at least one question, I guarantee that. All right. So for our next presenter, uh, I want to welcome uh, Dr. James Bennett. Uh, Dr. James Bennett completed his PhD in 2008 at RMIT University uh, in, in Melbourne, Australia. His background is in applied mathematics, and his current research interests include orbit determination and prediction, applied mathematics, debris object characterization, conjunction assessments, optical and laser debris tracking, and singular and regular perturbation methods. Uh, between 2011 and 2014, James was a, was a research fellow in the Space Research Center, RMIT, and EOS Space Systems. In January 2015, he became the leader of Research Program 3, Space Asset Management, with the Space Environment Research Center in Canberra, Australia. So welcome, James. Okay, um, so today I'll be talking about orbit element generation from an optical and laser debris checking catalog as part of work for the Space Environment Research Center. So a brief overview of the presentation is um, I'll start by introducing the Space Environment Research Center and the research programs within. I'll then talk about br very briefly about the first stage of the network construction and then I'll go into more research program, three specific things, which um, is to develop the catalog. So some initial progress to date will be uh, reported on and the beginnings of our catalog. So the Space Environment Research Center is a uh, an international collaboration between Lockheed Martin, EOS Space Systems, NICT in Japan, uh, Optus Satellite Systems, RMIT University and the Australian National University and future expansion of this collaboration is planned. So the ultimate goal of the Space Environment Research Centre is to develop a, a laser manoeuvre capability. So to get to this point, we, we've, we're split up into these research programs. Uh, it was originally four, now it's three, so the tracking and manoeuvre have been merged as one. Um, so within the tracking, we're looking at improving our tracking capability, deriving more information from the sensors to improve our information on the objects and their orbits. Uh, so that feeds into our orbit determination, which is handled by uh, Research Program 2. Uh, research Program 3 is what I'll be focusing more on today, and that's the, it's called collisions there, but it's really the meat and the sandwich of the whole thing where the better orbits feed into the catalog and the better tracking feed into the orbits and then eventually that'll pass off to the maneuver capability and the conjunction assessments. So stage one of construction is a partnership between Lockheed Martin and EOS, Spaces, EOS Space Systems with support from Australian DOD. Uh, so stage one sees uh, an optical and laser tracking station situated in Western Australia. Uh, some 3,500 k's from the existing site at Mount Stromlo, which is seen in the, the photo there. Um, so what we'll get from that is uh, an upgrade of Mount Stromlo station with precision three-dimensional observation data for LEO with optical and laser ranging and accurate optical observations for higher Earth orbits. So the aims of Research Program 3 to provide a high accuracy catalogue for reliable conjunction assessments, collision threat warning services, and eventually a laser manoeuvre capability. So we're aiming for higher accuracy orbital elements and orbit propagations, and enhance the geo orbit determination prediction by working closely with members of research program one uh, in adaptive optics. So there'll be two people presenting later on today from the ANU, uh, Francis Bennett and Celine. Uh, 
deal. I hope I pronounced that right. But uh, they'll be up in this afternoon session talking about the adaptive optics side of things. Um, so within this, we're, we want to in, improve how much we know about the object and get away from the simple spherical assumptions that we always make. Uh, so dynamic area to mass ratio, um, spin orientation and rate, and hopefully divide, uh, de develop a relationship between the, op the optical cross-section and the physical cross-sectional measurements. And with this, we will provide reliable and com computationally efficient conjunction assessment methods. So it's early days at the moment. Uh, so we've got an existing capability in a number of areas. Um, so we're now trying to bring those together into a cohesive system. Um, we've done a fair bit of work on analysing sparse optical and laser ranging data and how we can u best utilise the minimal data to still get a reasonable orbit from them. Um, so the question comes up, if we have a couple of passes, do we... Do we trust what, uh, what an orbit fit to those passes would give. So this momentum in previous research will be built upon and research outcomes will be, new research outcomes will be integrated as they become available. So for the catalogue, the draft data architecture and design specification has been completed. Um, the schema has also been completed. And so now we'll move towards a closed loop test where we'll take observations, process them through a catalogue architecture, produce an orbital element, then cue the station off that uh, orbital element. So this is the first step towards our cohesive working catalogue. Um, a relational, relational database design has been completed and within this be, uh, we've got object descriptions. So as we learn more about the object uh, through the the, the research developments, uh, these, these will be populated. So the orbit element generation will be part of the closed loop test. Um, so we've done a lot of work on analysing sparse data, so these methods will be extended and um, we'll get a, a full orbit element generation procedure. So we're looking for high accuracy state generation for debris objects, so, so for, for LEO, from optical and uh, laser ranging data, um, and for higher Earth orbits on uh, working off the optical uh, data. So the better, accu more accurate elements will lead to better orbit predictions and improved miss distance calculations, and we'll also have error information available, unlike the TLE data set, where we can get around that using estimation methods, for, you know, using multiple TLEs. So we're looking for a complete element set um, to improve our conjunction assessments. So I'll go into some examples of the orbit element accuracy. Uh, so these are single station results at the moment where we've fitted data from Mount Stromlo. Uh, so it's a simple orbit element where we have a, an orbital state and an area to mass ratio which is uh, constant. So no object specific information was used apart from that can, that can be derived from the TLE data. So these are the examples I'll be considering. Um, so the two low LEO objects there around the 700 to 760 kilometre perigee. So area to mass ratio was determined from a ballistic coefficient estimation method developed in the past at EOS Space Systems. Um, and for the higher LEO, so around 1,400 kilometres, uh, we switch over into this area to mass ratio generated from a new method deriving it from SRP. And, for, and the, same, the similar methods used for the higher geo orbits. So all this tracking was done off a mount model solution. Um, and in the LEO case for the first two examples had four passes of optical and laser ranging data fitted and then we move over into more sparse data cases where we had only fitted two passes in the 1400k perigee orbit and for the GA we look at two passes fitted uh, compared with four. So this is uh, the first example of the low LEO. We have a 1700, uh, 700 perigee object 
So this is comparing it to the SGP4. Um, so not a fair comparison because we're using more data in this case, but the SGP4 propagation was taken from the last available TLE in the, the fit window. So in this case, uh, four passes were fitted from a single station to get our updated element, and from there we propagated. Um, so we can still, so this combined pointing error uh, in arc seconds, so after three days we're around 29.8 arc seconds for this example, and after 10 days, if we were to queue the station off this element, would still be in the field of view. Um, and so this is the combined pointing residuals, and this is the range residuals for the, for the two data sets. So a similar example, and again, after around eight days, would still be in the field of view if we queued off this um, orbital element, updated orbital element. So these two examples use the area to mass ratio derived from the ballistic coefficient. And the following example will use the, the, um, the, the area to mass ratio derived from the SRP effects. So this is uh, the initial methodology has been completed and the results are showing promise. So it's very preliminary at this stage. Um, it's based on solar effects, uh, solar radiation effects on the semi-major axis, um, but it's leading to better orbit predictions and I'll present some results from that. So, this uh, test done on nice spherical ILRS objects, so Agisai, Edelon 1 and 2. And the truth data in the table is derived from information on the internet, and that gives us our, what I'm calling the true area to mass ratio. And then we have our estimated area to mass ratio derived from the, the method, methodology. So th they're giving reasonable uh, reflectivity values there. So that's derived from this gamma function using the truth data to get this. Um, but the, the nice thing about it is the consistency between Edelon 1 and 2, uh, which is sort of saying the method's not completely ridiculous. So here's some results from the SRP area to mass ratio propagations. Um, up the top there we have the standard SGP4, then we had a, an OD fitting two angular observations uh, holding the, the area to mass ratio fixed using the, the B star. So at this uh, perigee of 1400, they usually, it seems to be populated with uh, just um, a nominal value in the TLA catalog, so it, it, this value is not too accurate at all uh, derived from that, but, um, so, but using our New estimation, we're better than 200 metres in error after a little over four days. So it's in, improved the orbit prediction in this case. So the GR results, we've got a, a few cases here. The first case up the top there is a two-day orbit determination fitting two passes of angular observations. And this is a done off a mount model, so uh, uh, slightly lower accuracy than the than the using star cap, uh, star background, and the other ex the other results there are the um, two down the bottom there, which are probably hard to see, but um, they're from a longer orbit determination, but with four passes, so not that many, not that much more data, but we get a nice nice geometrical constraint on the orbit because of the long OD, and for the there's two cases shown there. Uh, one's where we held our estimate fixed uh, of the area to mass ratio, and the other is where we estimate it during the orbit determination process. So we're seeing when we estimate it, we've got positional areas better than a kilometre after 10 days uh, off a mount model solution. I ran a quick simulation for a medium Earth orbit, orbit uh, just to show that as expected, including more station data will improve the results. So I corrupted uh, the observations with, what, uh, with um, errors and ran an orbit determination study to show that we will get um, improved orbits from multiple station tracking data. So as soon as the WA station comes online, we can have some fun with some real data. 
So in summary, we're going in research program one, we're looking for the uh, better quality tracking data um, with the adaptive optics and other advancements made in that area. Better object characterization um, and better environment characterization. So through RP2, space, space weather effects will be looked at. So geomagnetic, geomagnetic disturbance forecasts, um, atmospheric mass density modeling will, will be calibrated. So this will get us to accurate and reliable object catalog, which will give us reliable conjunction assessments, and then hopefully towards a successful laser manoeuvre demonstration. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, I don't get to ask the question. Okay, Tom. Hello? You reached your quote on Wednesday morning, Marie. <laughs> so um, in your mount model solutions, how do you account for mount uh, biases? Do you calibrate them or uh, are not they with, estimated? They're estimated, uh, but we don't have a reference to calibrate them fully. So okay. um, yes, they are somewhat calibrated, yes. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you have uh, any idea how many orbits and what orbit regimes you might be able to do a catalog on. I mean, typically, uh, you know, surveillance operation from one or two sites is pretty demanding, pretty yes. hard to do, and, you know, so yes. what's, what's your what's your brand? So, we're, the idea is to bite it off into chunks. So, we'll go, initially, we'll build a catalog of interest to our partners, and then we'll build from there. So. We're hoping to get to a, a, a catalogue with in the order of 10,000 objects eventually, but it's going to be a slow process. And as you mentioned, with limited tracking stations, we'll only be able to make that expansion once the, the network expands. So, yes. Still have time. Um, if you're building a, a catalogue from scratch, I'm wondering if you've considered, <clears throat> excuse me, moving entirely away from TLEs, doing more of a in a Cartesian-based catalog. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, the TLEs will give us a nice way to easily move, uh, move into our own catalog, but extending on from that, we could do our own um, IODs and build our own uh, elements as well. So, but initially, we'll be working off the TLEs. Okay. You mentioned that your estimating SRP parameters from the orbit determination. I was wondering why you, you know, you mentioned some uh, estimation of uh, the changes in the semi-major axis. I was wondering why you're not going for full orbit determination, including just an SRP parameter and some additional parameters you might uh, need. Um, so could you repeat that last part? I missed the. I was wondering why you're not going to do a full orbit determination with the SRP parameters, one of the parameters you're going to estimate. Ah, yes. So that's headed towards sparse data cases. So if we don't have enough data to estimate that parameter, we need to estimate it using other means. So once we have enough data to do a full orbit determination solution, we will use that, will fit that in the, in the orbit determination. Um, so uh, I did some work with, in the low Earth orbit where um, but if we have two passes of optical and laser ranging data and you fit that um, and try and estimate the ballistic coefficient, you'll actually get worse results than if you left it fixed at a, at a good estimate. So it's working with that case, and then as soon as you switch over to a more complete orbital determination process with tra uh, extra tracking data, th that method gets thrown out and you do your fitting. Um, and defining that crossover point is going to be important as well. I mean, there, there is methods existing to deal with, uh, with sparse data, and still, you, you know, doing a, a correct job in, in estimating the orbital elements mm. or part of you know, part of the information, because if you if you if you come up with some you know uh, some uh, method which is 
just estimating part of the uh, real world thing, you, you could also be misled by that because mm. it's not just the uh, the uh, semi-major axis which is going to yes. be affected by the uh, yeah. SRP. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, for our last speaker before we break out for lunch, we're going to have Dr. Islam Hussein. So Dr. Hussein received his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in 2005. Uh, he's a two-year uh, recipient of the Senior Faculty Fellowship from the National Academy of Sciences, and he did some research with us at AFRL, and we had the pleasure, <clears throat> dare I say the honor of uh, having Dr. Hussein uh, work with us, and now he's going on to uh, bigger and brighter things with uh, multi-target tracking and estimation, so thank you. Thanks, Mariba. The honor is mine. <laughs> so uh, the title of my talk is Track to Track Data Association uh, Using Bharacharya Distance. Um, so the Track to Track Data Association problem is, uh, all right. Um, it's also known as the UCT correlation problem. Earlier on uh, this morning, uh, uh, there was uh, discussions about SADI um, and uh, the track, uh, the UCT correlation problem. So that's essentially work uh, that goes towards um, uh, that kind of uh, set of problems. Uh, let me make a distinction first uh, between several data association problems. Um, uh, the, the classical one is the observation to track association. Um, so this is where you basically have OBS, and you want to uh, figure out which uh, object generated this OB, an OB. Um, so that's the classical uh, problem right there. Then we also have the observation to observation association problem. This is where you have a bucket of data, and you want to figure out what OB, which subset of the OBS um, belong to each other, which one of them were generated by the same object. Uh, and that's a very important problem, again, uh, in uh, regards to uh, detection of new objects and uh, UCTs. We've done some previous work um, using information theoretic criteria to, uh, on this problem over the last year or so. Uh, so uh, there are references in the paper. You can go and uh, look at some of these uh, results. The final problem is the track-to-track -track association, which is when you have multiple tracks, at different time instances, and you're trying to determine which, uh, whether any of the tracks belong to the same RSO. Um, you can replace tracks with UCTs. So you have tracks at some time, uh, tracks at some other time, which of these tracks um, are, are the same, just propagated in time. And that's what, we will, that, that's what I will be talking about uh, today. Okay, so here's a statement of the problem again. So uh, basically what we're trying to do here is test a set of UCTs for association against a given set of tracks given at a different uh, time instance. The objective here is to develop a, and use information theory, uh, some, some, some new concepts uh, to solve this classical problem. Uh, the main index that we're considering in this paper or in this work is the Bhattacharya divergence, and I'll tell you more what, what that is. Um, what it is in a nutshell is, uh, for now, is basically a way to uh, evaluate how, light, how similar two probability density functions are. All right? We will also compare our method to um, our own implementation of the CBTA technique or the covariance based track association technique. We're um, going to make a, a, a performance comparison but also um, discuss some uh, rela the relationship between these two methods because they are actually. Uh, somewhat related. There are other things, uh, if, if, if you look at the program, the title of the paper has actually changed. Uh, it wasn't changed in the program. Um, it says the program says we will be using mutual information to solve the problem, but we ended up actually realizing that Bharacharya is actually um, outperforms uh, mutual information quite a bit. So uh, we're still looking into it, um, but that, that will come in, uh, in, in the future. All right, so um, what do we have? This is the problem statement and the assumptions. We have um, NT on certain tracks at some uh, time instance TI. Uh, we will label the track states as basically XI. So these are going to be an, uh, uncertain quantities. Um, we are also given N sub U, UCTs, at some other instant of time, T star, okay? Um, 
Right, so we take the tracks and we propagate it to some common point in time T star, some epoch T superstar. And we perform the uh, association analysis, um, the UCT analysis at that time uh, T star. All right, so this is a repeat of the statement that I made earlier on in previous slides. Some of the assumptions that we're making, um, you know, generally your tracks could be given at different time instances. For, for simplicity's sake, we'll just assume that they're all given at a common point in time, previous T sub star, different than T star, the analysis time, right? And what we will do is we'll take these tracks and propagate them to two T superscript star and uh, perform the analysis, as I said, at T superscript star. Some of the other assumptions that we have, this is an analysis that we're doing entirely, uh, you know, we're assuming that all PDFs for the UCTs as well as the tracks um, are given in terms of uh, Gaussian distributions. Uh, when we perform the propagation, uh, this allows us to use, for example, the UKF, and that's what we actually do. Um, what this also allows us to do is actually compute things like Bhattacharya div uh, divergence and other quantities in closed form. Which is, which is also nice. And I'll just mention for now that we also have ongoing work on using things like particle representation of uncertainty because they have, you know, they, they better model uncertainty. They're not just Gaussian. Um, so what else I can see here? But yeah, and again, for the sake of simplicity, we will assume that the given set of UCTs, um, the number of UCTs that were given are equal to the number of test tracks that were provided. You can generalize this, and I will also talk later on what happens if these are not the same. So what, what happens if there is the possibility, for example, of a birth of a new object? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I did mention again that we, we, we do use the UKF for propagation. Um, Gaussianity will imp obviously imp you know, impose performance limitations, and that's why we're looking at uh, particle-based techniques. We've actually had some good results in the past using particle, you know, particle methods for uh, propagation and analysis for um, the, some of the other data association problems, but we haven't done it for the UCT problem. All right, so what's Bhattacharya uh, divergence? So what it is essentially, so if you think of P and Q, these are PDFs. So you, given two PDFs, what's the distance? And I, I reluctantly use that expression. What's the, how far are these two PDFs from each other? How, how far or how close they are, how similar they are? So it's the statistical notion of distance. It's not quite a distance because it doesn't um, satisfy all uh, properties of a metric. It doesn't matter in this, in this work that it, it's not a proper distance or a proper metric, but if you want to use something like Bharacharya for optimization and you need to compute a gradient and measure distances, this will become important. Um, but anyway, so given two PDFs, P and Q, you can actually compute, uh, this is the expression, this is the mathematical expression um, in, uh, in integral form. And for the Gaussian case, you can actually show that the Bhattacharya distance is, um, is given by this expression here. So what are these? Um, mu, mu sub p, that's the mean for the uh, PDF p. Mu sub q is the mean for the PDF q. Sigma is essentially the average of the two covariances. And that's it. Um, the first term looks awfully similar to Mahalanobis distance, and that's why there's a relationship between CBTA and, uh, as I will discuss later, between CBTA and um, uh, Bharacharya. Okay. Um, is the, so I'm going to just briefly say the, the basic concept here. So like I said before, we have these tracks. We propagate them into the future to some common uh, analysis point. Um, we then take uh, each track and each UCT and test the distance, the Bhattacharya distance between uh, uh, the, this, this uh, track UCT pair, all right? And uh, basically, we test all combinations of pairings, and the one that has the smallest distance, uh, Bhattacharya distance, would be the, uh, our answer. That would be the association. This, this would be the solution to the um, association problem. Um, we can have duplicate associations. We may end up actually assigning multiple um, tracks to the same UCT. And what that really ends up doing is uh, you can have false positives, uh, but also you will have false negatives. And, in the, and because of the assumption that we have as many tracks as UCTs, the number of false positives and negatives will be the same. 
All right, so briefly, we haven't done this in this paper, but this is ongoing work. What happens if you have clutter or uh, new births? What if your UCT is essentially um, uh, just clutter? Uh, or something was just born and it's not in your catalog of, of tracks? Uh, well, um, we can e essentially, if you have some statistical model for clutter or new births, you can think of that as a, as a, as a uh, as a UCT, as a track, and do the test on it as well. Um, so we can, we can handle these things, um, we think. We should be able to handle these phenomena, but we don't do this in this paper. All right, so this is a very quick overview of CBTA. Um, so basically what CBTA is, is you compute the Mahanobis distance between a uh, track UCT uh, pair. Um, and then what you end up finding is that the Mahanobis distance squared is essentially a chi-squared distribution. You then go ahead and uh, there's a lookup table. You specify what significance level or equivalently what confidence level do you want. And then from that you can uh, extract out uh, which track and UCT have a, sig a significant statistical relation, um, value. In the CBTA case, um, Sometimes you do not have a statistical significance for any pair. So and in this case, you basically um, will end up not uh, associating any of the UCTs. And that's why you can have, in CBT, you can have false positives. You can have false positives. Let me go back. You can have false positives that are not equal to the false negatives. So uh, these rates will be uh, different. Okay. Uh, so, we, we implement the two methods, the, the Bhattacharya based method and CBTA. Um, here we looked at 10 objects and two, 10 UCTs. Um, what we do here, the analysis that you'll see next, is we, we put these objects, uh, the tracks are, uh, are separated by some one sigma uh, covariance in, in both distance and velocity. And then we change that one sigma we brought. So we try to study the effect of how, you know, the closeness of the objects. Um, uh, as they get closer, there will be more ambiguity about the statistics. Um, so how do we perform as these objects get closer and farther away from each other? Uh, we perform, uh, also we study the effect of the duration between UCT capture and tracks that are given. So we look at one day separation, three day, and five sidereal days. We tested for four different orbital regimes, um, and these are the parameters that we considered. We do perform a Monte Carlo simulation, as I said, because these, uh, the separation between objects are statistically determined. So for the Leo case, um, this is a little hard to see. It's a little difficult to see this, but what you see here on the x-axis, this is the one sigma uh, separation between objects. It, we, we start something very close to zero, almost, almost co-located, co up to two kilometers. Um, on the y-axis, you see the true positive rate. And I'm plotting the true positive rate for the CBTA method as well as the um, Bhattacharya metric. And the different colors are for different separations in the velocity space. So also the, we're not only looking at how close two objects are in position, but we also look at the effect of velocity closeness. Um, it's a little hard to see, but there are two blue lines, for example, and two magenta lines, two red lines, and two green ones. One has um, basically a line going through the dots, and the other one doesn't have any line. The, ones with, the lines are basically the uh, Bhattacharya uh, uh, results, and the unlined ones are CBTA. And if you look closer, what you will see here is that for each, across both position, separation, and um, Velocity separation, but Acharya outperforms uh, CBTA across the board. Okay, um, getting really close to almost 100% true positives uh, if the objects are well separated from each other. Likewise, so this is for a one-day sidereal day simulation. Likewise, for two days and for five days, and it's across the board. Um, here are the results for uh, a Mayo uh, orbit. The behavior is a little bit different, but again, the overall message here is that the new, this new metric, Bhattacharya, is, is outperforms uh, CBTA. And similar things can be said also for um, GTO and GEO. 
Um, some of the why the phenom phenomena are different in Geo, like if you look at these plots, they look a little bit different than when you see what you see, for example, for Leo. Uh, this is something we're still trying to, to understand. Uh, this is the first set of uh, results on, on this work. So there are things that out there that we need to understand. That, all this analysis was done in um, Cartesian coordinates. We did it also in equinoctial um, uh, elements uh, using a uh, more so uh, the previous results also assumed a two-body problem. Here we included uh, SRP, um, an EGM, 8x8 eight eight EGM gravity model, drag and sun and moon uh, third-body effects together. And again, consistent results with what we saw before. Both methods improved, CBTA as well as Bharacharya. Both of them improved, the, their performances improved. On margin, uh, CBTA benefited more from the equinoctial propagation uh, only because, uh, you know, when, when you're at 90% per, uh, positive rate, um, you, can, you have a room to increase by as much as 10%. But when you, um, a method like Bharacharya is a uh, success rate of 99%, this is, you know, how much can you improve on that? So, um, so anyway, so that's that. Okay, so what are we doing right now? I have about a couple of minutes. So we, need, we are working on modeling clutter and new births. Uh, we're also looking at how do we address the combinatoric problem? So underlying this, uh, there's a big challenge, right? The n squared phenomena. Um, there's a, a, a very difficult combinatoric problem to be solved. So we're, we're thinking about that, how to actually uh, we're, we're looking into things like randomization techniques to try to find the optimal association without having to uh, thoroughly go through each uh, uh, possibility. Okay, um, then we're also looking at other metrics of divergence and mutual information. There are so many information theoretic criteria out there and we want to understand, you know, what is the best method, what's the be best metric, so to speak, that we, one can use um, for some of these association problems. All right, so, so that's basically uh, our current uh, future work, some of the f current and future work that we're doing, and uh, I would love to take any questions. Thank you. Hi, um, so doesn't the monetary distance suffer the sort of the paradox when, when one of the objects becomes much more uncertain and if everything else is fixed, the actual distance gets larger? Mm -hmm. So how do you treat, how do you, deal with that, that issue? Uh, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, is, does this still work? Can, it, yeah. can, can we go? Okay, I'll, I think I can do that here. Okay. So if I understand you right, so um, you can actually have a very large distance between the, uh, the two tracks. Is that? No, what I mean is that like, if uh, right, I'm sorry. If, if you if the actually are over the actually are, are consistent uh, um, tracks, but because the volumetric term, the logarithmic term, comes in, if one of them, if sort of parametrically, if you make it more uncertain, it spreads the distribution right. out, and then you effectively get a larger distance. That's even, true. You know. that, that would happen. Yeah. So, yeah. how does that affect your your, your basically your association criteria? Well, if that, if that ambiguity cannot, would not be resolved, but that, yeah, exactly, the, the, that would not, um, we would not be able to associate correctly. Okay. Yep. So, um, I'm trying to develop a little bit of intuition here uh, and having a little trouble. Um, so, you know, this, one of the appealing things about CBTA is, you know, you, you can sort of directly tie it to uh, making a maximum likelihood decision and, you know, and that, and, and then also to a, a, a Bayes cost criterion, uh -huh. right? And uh -huh. um, so you're kind of, in essence, you're kind of giving that up by going to this Bhattacharya distance. Is that yes, true statement? we are. Okay. Yep. Um, and, and just one other thing, um, are you, did I hear you correctly? Are you assuming that everything's kind of Gaussian distributed? You're sort of proceeding from there? We're assuming for now that the, the two, yeah, the statistics are Gaussian. So is it, is it possible that the difference in performance you're seeing is because the fact that the, stati the statistics really aren't Gaussian and, and therefore the Bhattacharya really sort of deals with that better? Than the, the assumption system? is made for both methods. Okay, and, and you're generating simulated data. So uh, they are provided exactly the same data. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, I find the whole thing quite interesting because when you look at your approach, you're really looking at an inner product, 
of the two probability distributions. And that's kind of cool, but now when you look at the Mahalanobis distance approach, that, that looks at the inner product with, that's weighted by the covariance. Have you seen, have, have you seen um, anything, any advantage to that approach? Well, so the, I, I, I did promise that I will talk about the uh, relationship between Bharacharya and Mahalanobis distance or CBTA. And the relationship is this, this first term, forget about that one-eighth scaling factor, that first term is, is essentially the metric that you use in CBTA. That's essentially uh, Mahalanobis distance right there. So Bharacharya, what it does is, and that goes back to the very first question that was asked about the ambiguity, it, it, I, I believe the reason why Bharacharya outperforms CBTA consistently is that it just doesn't look at the differences in means weighted by the covariance, but it also looks at the differences between the covariances. All right? And I think it's that second term that gives this uh, edge of Bharacharya over CBTA. Yeah. Yeah, but that's exactly, so you can think of uh, Bharacharya distance as basically Mahalanobis plus a second effect, a covariance-based effect. Okay, any more questions? I guess one quick one from me is, in your uh, evaluation of uh, basically distances and, and the mutual information, do you think that maybe, maybe the reason the mutual information didn't work so well is more due to its interpretation because the divergence is more distance whereas the mutual information is like one of the terms that talks about overlap. Yep, yep. Pa Paul and I had so many conversations uh, with our team and it's always, a, it's, there's a philosophical conversation about what, what's the meaning of mutual information and absolutely we've had many, many talks about that. Mutual information outperformed divergence in other association problems but here we're having a little bit of a difficulty but we're still sorting through that. So the next uh, presenter we have is Jay McMahon. He's an assistant research professor at the University of Colorado. His research interests include astrodynamics, autonomous GNNC, asteroid science, and dynamics. He received his PhD in aerospace engineering sciences from CU Boulder in 2011, and his master's uh, from University of Southern California in 2006. From 2004 to 2008, he worked on launch vehicle guidance at the Aerospace Corporation El Segundo. Welcome. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming back after lunch. Hopefully you didn't eat too much so that you'll fall asleep during my talk or not. Uh, so my name is Jay McMahon. Uh, I'm at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Dan Shears, uh, who helped me along with this work. So today we're going to talk about solar radiation pressure modeling and why it's important to do that more accurately if you want to uh, continue to improve uh, the, the space object catalog. So uh, a few of the basic background points, of course, uh, accurate solar radiation pressure models are necessary for precise orbit determination, and that's mostly what I'll be talking about here. So uh, if, if you're thinking in, in terms of initializing tracks or initial orbit determination, you're going to think that, you know, higher fidelity solar radiation pressure models are crazy, and, you know, for that application they might be. But for the longer term application of trying to accurately track and predict where objects are going to go, uh, you really want to improve your solar radiation pressure model, and I'll show this through a few examples. One of the reasons this is important for catalog maintenance, maintenance in particular is that there's a lot of effort and money being put into making, getting more observations of everything, right? And then once you get all these observations, you have to be able to put the observations together so you know which object you're looking at, which tracks correlate with one another. We just heard a nice talk from Islam earlier about correlating all these tracks. But if you don't have the right dynamics in your system, so you don't propagate the tracks to the same epoch appropriately, you have no hope of correlating these tracks, right? So this is where improving solar radiation pressure modeling in particular, but your dynamics models in general, uh, to make them more accurate, can really help things out for catalog maintenance. OK, so I have a few brief slides of math. Uh, this, for those of you who haven't seen this before, because I haven't presented it here, uh, what I've been working with for a number of years is setting up a Fourier series model uh, to represent the solar radiation pressure. 
And on the top here, I have the typical equations that just show uh, your basic Lambertian diffuse reflection and specular reflection BRDF. Uh, and so you can, if you know the shape model, you know what you're looking at, because like for this talk, I'm simulating the data so I can set up the quote unquote truth to test things. Uh, you can plug all these things in, predict what the solar radiation pressure force should be at any given time, and then you can decompose that into a Fourier series model that depends on where the sun is with respect to the body. So I use a, a solar latitude and longitude to decompose this Fourier series. The important thing that I'm going to show you in this talk is you really want to think about comparing this higher fidelity model, right? This can capture a lot of different phenomenology. And you want to compare that to the model that's typically used in the catalog, right, which is just our well-known cannonball model. And so the main feature of the cannonball model is that it's some constant force that's directed away from the sun, right? And this works great if you have a satellite like Lagios, which was a cannonball and had pretty uniform optical properties all around, right? So this was a great representation. Uh, and they could do really precise OD with that. But for most satellites, that are not cannonballs and have complicated shapes and many different types of materials on the surface, this is actually not a great approximation. And although solar radiation pressure is a small force, I'll show you through the examples here that it adds up and using this can give you a lot of trouble for precise orbit determination. So I'll be talking a lot about the cannonball model. I'll be talking about a first order Fourier series model where I keep only the n equals zero and one terms. Now I'll be talking about something that I call the three constant model, which if you think about it in terms of the Fourier series is just the zeroth order term. If you think about it compared to a cannonball model, it's similar in that it's a constant force, but it doesn't have to be directed away from the sun. It can be in any direction. Okay, so that didn't fit in the box apparently because it's a very important note, right? So I said at the top, I'm using this nice, simple BRDF. And there are many people here who have more experience than me that know that many materials don't follow that BRDF, right? That's one of the key nice features of using a model like this to represent your solar radiation pressure force for precise orbit determination. Because the, even if I use this BRDF and it's completely wrong for some given materials, once the object's on orbit, I'm going to estimate these coefficients. And because of the broad general functional form of this model, it doesn't matter what BRDFs I started with for my a priori guesses. If I can get enough data to estimate this, this model can represent the solar radiation pressure force from any BRDF. Okay? So in this particular talk, I use the nice simple one because I have that mechanized uh, in my tools, but you can change that and use whatever you want. Okay? Okay, so one extra step uh, to get to estimating things that I'd like to talk about briefly is some of the details. You have to have some basis set for which you're going to express these Fourier series coefficients in. So a typical basis set that, you're, that is useful for estimation is the RIC frame or the LVLH frame. So you can set things up in that frame. If you know the attitude of the body somehow, then you could use the body fixed frame as a basis set which is nice because then the Fourier coefficients are fixed to the body. That's ideal, but usually you don't know the attitude, so you use a base set like LVLH that's tied to the orbit. Uh, similarly, you have a frequency here, right? This frequency is, if you were using the body fixed frame, it would be how fast the body is spinning. If it were a simple spinner, uh, how the, the spin rate of the body. If you're using the LVLH frame, you'd use the orbit right here, the mean motion. Um, and depending on, you know, there are a lot of intricacies with figuring out what to use or what you're capable of using, and it depends, of course, on the case and what data you have. So in this talk, I'll have two different cases. First, we'll look at uh, an empty upper stage model. This is basically, I'll show you the model in a minute, but it's basically something that looks kind of like an empty upper stage. It's roughly the size of, uh, you know, an Arian 5 upper stage. Here, we're, we're looking at a, a case where it's an inertially fixed uniform rotator. So the spin axis is fixed inertially. Uh, it's spinning at some constant rate about that axis. So you can use 
this basis set, um, since it's inertially fixed, you can actually just pick an inertial frame for your basis set, uh, and preferably you know what the spin axis is. That would be one of your frame, or one of your basis vectors, and then you would pick the other two just orthogonal to that. Uh, and the constant frequency would be the spin rate. Okay, so this is something where we had a little more information than, than just a totally unknown object. Uh, the second case, this is a hammer MLI type object, so this is basically just a, a piece of hammer debris, it's a wrinkled sheet. Uh, so here we don't, we're assuming we don't know things like the spin axis or spin rate. Uh, and I'll show you the dynamics, it's tumbling, I ha it's actually a six off simulation, so I have the SRP torques in there too, so it's tumbling around. Uh, so you can't really use the body fixed frame because that, first of all, you don't know it, and second, it doesn't help you. Uh, so here we use the basis set of the LVLH frame or the RIC frame, and the frequency we use here uh, is just the orbit frequency. So even though this is a tumbling object with a changing angular velocity, we're going to use the orbit frequency to do our estimation. Okay, so there's basically four key points I want to make here. And these should be obvious to everybody who does orbit determination if you think about it, but sometimes it gets lost in the shuffle, right? So these are the points that I want to emphasize here and why you want to have the correct force model if you want to do precise orbit determination. So if you have the wrong force model, these four things crop up. First of all, the state can't be accurate, accurately estimated, right? That should go without saying, but if you have to propagate information over any given amount of time that's you know, greater than some very small value, having the wrong force model is going to cause you to drift off from the truth. Uh, the covariance becomes unrealistically small. Basically, uh, you're estimating the wrong thing. Your filter thinks you know more than you do, and uh, your covariance becomes small. So if you estimate the wrong state and have a small covariance around that state, you're starting to get into real trouble. Uh, you can't fit long arcs of data. Again, this is a propagation issue, right? So if you try and propagate, if you have an estimate at one time, even if you nailed that estimate, but then you try and propagate it to a later time, say, I mean, this is basically the track correlation problem, uh, you won't be able to do that if you have the wrong force model because your propagation won't line up with your new measurements. And if you don't have the right force model and the right parameters in there to estimate, you have no hope of making that work. And I'll illustrate this. And finally, of course, is the propagation, right? So even if somehow you manage to estimate the state accurately, uh, you know, irregardless of any of these other issues that come up, uh, once you're at the end of your data and you want to propagate forward to make predictions, if you have the wrong force model, of course, this will diverge from the truth. Okay, so let's start looking at some examples. Okay, so first I'm going to look at some propagation errors. Uh, basically, just make up a truth model based on the shape propagate things forward and see what kind of errors occur compared to a cannonball model, for example. Uh, I do try and help the cannonball model out. I give it the exact uh, area to mass ratio of the body, the exact attitude, everything possible. So this is the best case for the cannonball model. Start with the exact initial conditions and we just see how it diverges over time. Okay, so here's the first case uh, with the empty upper stage. We just have this simple upper stage model. I put a little engine bell on there so it wouldn't be perfectly symmetric. Uh, here's the area to mass ratio. This is basically mimicking something covered with white paint. So it's uh, most of the row is reflectivity. It's mostly reflective. And then this is the component of that that's diffuse. So it's only 5% or sorry, that's specular. So it's, only, it's mostly a diffuse reflector. It's just matte white paint. Uh, in the bottom left here, you see the errors that build up over the course of just five days uh, for, for this body. It's in the, this is in the GTO trajectory. Sorry, I didn't say that. So over the course of five days, uh, compared to the cannonball model, you have, you know, kilometer level errors after five days. You have half a meter per second to a meter per second uh, of velocity errors. Uh, in the top right, you see what the actual solar radiation pressure force is doing. And then the dashed white line in the middle is what the cannonball model would give you. So it's hard to see the subscripts here, but this particular frame is lined up so that the U direction is along the sun to earth line. And then the V and W directions are just in the plane perpendicular to that. So for the cannonball model, it wants to have a constant value in the U direction and then zero in the other two directions. If you zoom in, this is just a zoom in here so you can see the periodicity that actually occurs 
if you really model this shape and actually see what the solar radiation pressure force is doing uh, as a function of time. So this is just over the first 12 hours down here. You can see that it repeats. Uh, it's periodic. It's not, since this isn't a perfectly symmetric body, uh, you know, it's not just a nice sinusoid, but there's some more uh, interesting behavior there. Okay. Things, of course, get more interesting uh, when using a high area to mass ratio object. So uh, the shading is kind of hard to see, but basically what I have is a, a mock-up of a wrinkled sheet of mylar uh, or something similar. So the area to mass ratio here is 10, right? This is in uh, meters squared per kilogram. So it's, it's a high area to mass ratio. It, this is uh, reflectivity of 0.4, but most of that is specular. Okay. So on the top here, I'm showing, uh, a, this is just kind of a different way to show what all the Fourier coefficients give you. So depending on the latitude and the longitude of the sun in this frame, you would get different components of the solar radiation pressure force uh, in the body fixed frame. Like I said before, this was integrated uh, in a six DOF simulation. So there's another set of coefficients like this that are related to these coefficients that control the torque on the body. I'm assuming the body is rigid, even though, of course, we know in reality this would not be a rigid body. Uh, but for the sake of simulation, we assume it's a rigid body tumbling around. And it wobbles all over the place, which gives rise to this very interesting uh, solar radiation pressure force. And this is in the same frame. So if this was the cannonball model, you want to have a constant non-zero value in the u direction, and then zero values in the other directions. You see here, if you take the average of this solar radiation pressure force over the 72 hours, uh, it's, not, it's a non-zero average, right? So the cannonball model won't even fit the average of this case. Uh, and over the course of only three days, we're off by 1,000 kilometers if we try and use the cannonball model for these objects. So track correlation is going to get tricky. OK, so really what we're interested in, of course, is can we estimate these things? And uh, so I put together a few simulations, probably more, way more than I have time to talk about, of course. Uh, but I'll try and run through some of the main results here. Uh, when I show some tables, you can read kind of what I've put in here. Uh, when I show the tables, I have these four metrics with which I compare the, two, the different types of models. So we look at the 3D position RMS errors, 3D velocity RMS errors. We look at a maximum position error in each axis normalized uh, by the uncertainty in that axis. So this basically gives you kind of a uh, per axis or a maximum axis Mahalanobis distance almost. Uh, and then we look at a 3D RMS post-fit residual scale by the measurement noise. So ideally you want this to be one, right, if you fit the data. Okay, so first with the upper stage. So this is that, that same orbit that I just showed you the errors for. I'm showing your post-fit residuals here for the cannonball model the three constant model, and the Fourier model, the first order Fourier series. And you can see the metrics up here. So this is over the course of 120 hours or five days. Of course, I'm assuming we get data over this whole thing, and we can talk about my scenario, right? It's more to stress the measurement, the force models than to actually uh, mimic reality in, in measurement cases. But you can see that even for this case where we have all this data, we can see everything, right? Uh, the cannonball model can't fit this data, right? The position error is 437 meters. We only have measurement error noise on the order of 10 meters, so we should be able to fit this much more accurately. The three constant model and the Fourier series model do much better. Uh, when you start propagating things out, it just really gets troublesome for the cannonball model, right? We have 70 sigma propagation errors, okay? And that's over the course of 28 days, which I show here. So if you propagate it for 28 days, uh, your error is in black and your covariance is in green. So if you're using the covariance model, your covariance is just completely not representing reality here, and your errors are huge. This is just position. These are uh, on the order of kilometers. And this is for, again, for an upper stage. So this is something that you would think it's a fairly low area to mass ratio. You would think SRP doesn't do much to it, right? But clearly it has a big effect. If you use the other two models, you can see things work much better. The covariance is more realistic, and the errors stay appropriately small, much less than a kilometer. So we would be happier with that. OK, so the more interesting stuff is the, uh, the hammer objects. 
which I'll go through quickly since Mariba's crowding me. Uh, <laughs> so what I want to show here is just if you start with the true initial condition, so I'm giving the filter the truth to start and seeing what happens. And all this shows, and you can find all the details in the paper, is that the cannonball model, given the truth, no matter how much data you try and process, it, do, it doesn't improve on the truth, right? And in some cases, it actually diverges. So it's not fitting the data whatsoever. And over here, if you actually give it an error, uh, it, gets, it gets worse, right? Or, I mean, it improves ever so slightly, but it's orders of magnitude worse than using either of the other improved models. And if I'm going to skip forward to one more result, since I'm running out of time here. So those other results had a lot of data, right? So let's look at when we have less data. So here I only say five measurements over two minutes, and I have an X hour gap where X is given by the axis here. So up to a 100 hour gap, five measurements over two minutes, 100 hour gap, right? So how do we do? And again, we see that the cannonball model is not fitting things. It has 3D RMS position errors in the hundreds to thousands, to tens of thousands kilometers, it's, it's just not fitting anything. Whereas the other two models are down here in 10 to minus two in kilometers, right? So we're talking uh, basically tens of meters, right? So we can get very nice results with these, you know, slightly more complicated, but not insanely complicated uh, Fourier series or constant models. Uh, much, much better than what the cannonball model can do for you. Okay, so. Since I'm rambling for too long, I'll leave the conclusions up and I'll take any questions if we have time. Thank you. Um, this is, has obvious similarities to the inversion problem in photometry. Um, and what we're typically concerned with there is how much a priori do we have to bring to the problem and then how many parameters do we have to estimate once we've done that. Uh, if we take a typical piece of debris where we don't really know the size, we don't know the shape, we don't know the material properties, uh, you know, we'll do our estimation. I agree with you, the cannonball, mo cannonball model is weak, but we're only estimating seven or eight parameters. In that situation, how much a priori do I have to bring to use your improved model, and how many parameters do I have to estimate? That's a, that's a perfect question. Thanks for setting me up. Um, so the, the, constant, the three constant model that I've shown here, Instead of one parameter for SRP, you're estimating three. Okay, so you're adding two extra parameters, and you're getting, like in that last example I showed you, where I don't have a lot of data, you're getting you know, five orders of magnitude improvement in position accuracy. And I'm initializing all those cases uh, with the cannonball model, with just a ballistic coefficient. So I, I'm starting at zero on the other two parameters and just letting it fit. So, so two parameters extra is the answer. Okay, short you're answer. No a priori assumptions about shape, facets? No, not with, I mean, I, I, yeah, I have an initial ballistic coefficient, right? But I have my covariance wide open. I, I'm doing a batch fit anyways. But. Okay. Quick. It was, yeah, I was just wondering if you've thought about um, estimating the, the rotation rate, since you don't, you don't necessarily know that. Could you estimate it? Uh, well, this is, again, how much data do I have? Right, um, and, and what kind of data do I have? Okay, so it, I wasn't set up to estimate attitude here. Uh, and like I said in the first case, in the upper stage, I kind of assumed I knew the, the attitude rates. Uh, but with the hammer object, I'm not estimating anything about the spin state and I can fit, still fit the orbit. So definitely the next step is, you know, if I have the data, what can I get about the attitude state? If it's quick, Arthur, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask, what kind of motion is, is the, uh, the hammer undergoing? It's totally tumbling, uh, mm -hmm. and it's in, yeah, I didn't put that up here. This is a six stop simulation, like I said. Mm -hmm. The SRB torques are in there. It, it's spinning up over the course of this time period, so the rotation rate is increasing. Mm -hmm. I started at just like one degree per second, but it just spins up the whole time. Which uh, should and eventually undergo like a flat rotation, right? Just from the, the, the internal degrees of freedom, I imagine. Well, if you have enough energy damping in there, um, I don't, this is a rigid body and I don't have energy damping, but okay. um, in, in this case, it doesn't go into a flat spin because there's a constant solar torques acting on it and it doesn't okay. average to zero. Okay. And the next piece of research he's gonna work on is the totally tumbling model, because you heard it here first. It's not just tumbling, it's totally tumbling. <laughs> All right. So let's thank our speaker again, please. So next up we have Dan Luby. 
So Dan is a PhD student at the University of Colorado working with uh, Professor Dan Shears in the Celestial Space Flight and Mechanics Lab. His research interests focus on estimation theory, SSA, and uncertainty quantification. He's supported by a NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship in addition to being a SMEED fellow. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for the intro. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. Uh, again, my name is Dan Luby from the University of Colorado, where I work with my advisor, Dr. Dan Shears. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about an algorithm we developed called the Adaptive Optimal Control Based Estimator, which we're applying towards a problem of real time maneuver detection. There we go. Um, so as an outline, I'll start with some overview and motivation behind the work, uh, then talk to you about the estimator, its maneuver detection properties, and the automation method we did to make it into an adaptive estimator. Uh, from there, I'll give some simulations and results for a specific case where we applied to a, a looking at a spacecraft in geo undergoing unknown uh, station keeping maneuvers, and from there, uh, give some conclusions and some suggestions for future work. Uh, so just as some overview and motivation, um, the general problem we're looking at here is estimation in dynamically mismodeled systems, uh, where we want to identify, compensate for the mismodeling, as well as characterize and reconstruct it. The specific application here is space situational awareness, and as everyone here knows, uh, we're tracking in the neighborhood of 20,000 objects, but there is far more, less than the 10 centimeter cutoff that's generally quoted. Um, and a lot of that is f debris from collisions and breakup events. Um, and in general, uh, something that makes it difficult to understand what's going on up there is the data sparse nature of SSA, uh, as well as the fact that a lot of the observations are non-cooperative, just meaning that there's no direct data relay between the observer and the target. Uh, it's important to understand the dynamics of this environment and understand the populations of this environment if we're going to maintain uh, safe robotic and manned access to it. And because there's so many objects up there, we need highly automated algorithms to keep up with the observations that are uh, coming out. So what we propose here is the uh, adaptive optimal control base estimator, which is capable of automatic state estimation maneuver detection, characterization, reconstruction, and dynamics estimation. Uh, so the estimator is a sequential estimator uh, similar to a Kalman filter. A standard estimator like the Kalman filter operates on, you have some a priori information, you propagate it forward, get your measurement, update your trajectory, and keep doing that as measurements come. And the issue is the trajectory you get out at the end is disjointed. You don't really know what's happening in between measurements. And that's fine for high data rate problems, but for data sparse problems, you want to have a better estimate of where you are in between. Um, so what the optimal control based estimator does is output an optimal control policy with the states so that you get a continuous uh, state trajectory in the end. And then you can use those controls to estimate the mismodeling within the system. So I'm not going to go over the derivation or anything like that, just some key points. Uh, so what you see here is the cost function for it. There's three terms that create the optimal control base estimator. The first is an a priori term that accounts for our initial guess in the state. Then we have a measurement term that takes the information from the measurement and folds it in. And if we just take these two pieces of information, assume a dynamical model, and go from there, if that dynamical model is mismodeled, we'll get suboptimal performance. So we add a third term in there that accounts for dynamic mismodeling, essentially absorbs it and outputs it as an optimal control policy. Then we can take that control and figure out what the mismodeling was. I'm going to point out this one little matrix here, the Q matrix, uh, our assumed dynamic uncertainty. It's essentially uh, quantifying the level of mismodeling within the system. Uh, and it's up to the user to determine this, but what the adaptive aspect of this estimator will do is figure out what that is automatically. Um, so taking that cost function, uh, minimizing it, we get three necessary conditions for optimality uh, as shown here. There's no analytical solution for an arbitrary nonlinear system, so we linearize and iterate on that linearization. Uh, we call that linearization the Generalized Linear Optimal Control Based Estimator, or GLOCB. Um, it's linearized about an arbitrary initial state and adjoint, adjoint just being a term that tells you what your optimal control policy is. So I won't go over the linearization procedure. 
And I'm not going to go over the equations too much. Those are in the paper. But I want to kind of show what physically is happening under the hood for the estimator. Um, so we start with our a priori information. We get a measurement at some later time. And we develop these equations to look like a Kalman filter uh, so that we make comparisons to it. So we have a time update like a Kalman filter where we propagate the a priori information to the uh, measurement epoch. Unlike a Kalman filter, though, we have biasing in there to account for a biased nominal trajectory that accounts for mismodeling. That's what that B term there stands for. And that V term uh, specifically accounts for the effects of dynamic uh, mismodeling. Uh, so it's similar to a process noise term in a Kalman filter. And like a process noise, it inflates the uh, covariance at the measurement epoch. Um, so we have a measurement update like the Kalman filter, but we're estimating uh, states at both epochs along with the adjoint. And that adjoint will tell us what our optimal control policy is. So what physically happens is we update the initial state, we estimate a control through the adjoint, and then propagate that forward to get our final state. Uh, of course, there's uncertainties that go with these estimates. Uh, I won't talk about them here. They're in the paper. But what I do want to point out is that the estimator is unbiased and that the expectation of your state estimates is equal to truth. And the expectation of your control estimate is actually equal to your a priori guess of it. So the estimator does not assume additional mismodeling, but it's robust in that if their errors dictate there should be mismodeling, it adds it. Uh, so that kind of goes over how the estimator works, and I'll talk about the maneuver detection applications of it. So the method we're using here is based on that of Holzinger, Shears, and Alfred's control distance metrics approach. Uh, the reason we do that is the cost function of the optimal control-based estimator has a term in there that's very similar to their control distance metric. Uh, so for our purposes, we'll be using three different metrics, the control metric, uh, the measurement distance metric, and the a priori distance metric, as shown here. Basically, the three components of the OCB cost function. Uh, so it's physically significant to the problem. As far as maneuver detection process goes, we process the measurements in the GLOCB, uh, calculate the metrics, and then we need to calculate a threshold, a statistically significant one. And to do this, we define a threshold percentile, say 99%, so uh, anything on the 1% tail is considered a deterministic mismodeling. Anything below that is stochastic error. Uh, and then we map this to a chi-squared value. And then we apply Pearson's approximation to reformulate that as a chi-squared statistic. Then we map the chi-squared threshold to the metric hold via this approximation. So in the end, we have our calculated metric, our calculated threshold, and we compare them to one another. If it's less than the threshold, we uh, confirm our null hypothesis that there's no uncompensated deterministic mismodeling within the system. Yet if we exceed it, we make a detection and say that there is uncompensated deterministic mismodeling within the system. Uh, the key word there being uncompensated. The way we compensate it for it is with that Q matrix, the assumed dynamic uncertainty. So as soon as we make this detection, it's a flag for us to adjust that value so that we can push our metric below the threshold. And that's what we do in the adaptive optimal control based estimator. So maneuver detection tells us if we set that value correctly, uh, the default value we use is something called the dynamic noise floor, which is, it represents the lowest amount of mismodeling we really care about. Anything below it is negligible. And we always process with this level unless the maneuver detection results tell us that we should adjust it. As far as maneuver detection definition for this uh, algorithm, uh, first has to come is a detection. Detection being all three metrics simultaneously exceed their thresholds. And then after this, we need n successive detections to declare a maneuver has occurred. Uh, so basically, that n value is set by the user. If you say it's two, you wait for one detection, you see the second, then you retroactively go back, compensate for it, and then move forward. And this is all in an automated procedure. So after the maneuver is detected, we want to automatically select the dynamic uncertainty to compensate for the mismodeling. And the way we do that is through a criterion that says the mean of the distance metric uh, distribution should be equal to the metric, since this is our best estimate of what it should be. Um, and to obtain that solution, uh, which is shown in this plot here, we use a basic Newton secant method. Basically, we're just looking for the intersection of that blue and red curve. Um, and as you can see in log log space, the behavior is strongly linear, so you really don't need more than a couple iterations to converge. 
Um, so that defines the algorithm now to show how it actually works. Um, for the simulation, we have a geospacecraft undergoing uh, unknown station keeping maneuvers, so the estimator does not know anything about them. Uh, in truth, they are low thrust maneuvers, time fix, four hours, that correct longitude and latitude errors uh, independently for east, west, north, south maneuvers, respectively. Um, in terms of dynamics, we have two body, J2, SRP, sun and moon, third body maneuvers. You can add higher order gravity. It really doesn't matter as long as the perturbations you're adding in are properly modeled. If they're not, the estimator is going to try to detect that mismodeling, and it's fine to have natural and artificial mismodeling together. In terms of measurements, we have uh, Observation windows for two hours a night, observations every 100 seconds. Again, you can make that more sparse, more rich. Obviously, your results are reflective of the amount of information in the system. Um, and we're using range and optical data. And I'll make a comment on angles only uh, observation here at the end. So in truth, we have two events uh, in the span of 15 days, one being east-west, one being north-south. So the point of this simulation is detect those and only those, hopefully. Uh, and that is exactly what we do. So. What I'm plotting here is the metric to threshold ratio. Um, so basically anything exceeding one in these plots is a detection for that specific metric, with the control metric being on the left, the measurement in the middle, and the a priori on the right. So between these three metrics, they detect between 12 and 15 events on their own, uh, which corresponds well to our 99% threshold. Um, but when we combine the metrics together, saying a detection counts only when all three are, uh, exceed their metrics together, we can reduce that number to four. And then when we implement that delay mechanism, saying that we're waiting for two simultaneous detections, we can reduce that to two. Uh, as I said, there's only two true maneuvers in this data set, and these two detections correlate completely to those two. Um, so we can say in the 1,100 measurements that we have here, there are uh, no false detections for this specific example. Um, so now that we've detected our maneuvers, we want to move forward and figure out what they were. Uh, and that's information we already have through our control estimates. Uh, and these are the control estimates in a hill frame, just the magnitudes. And the two maneuvers clearly stand out in magnitudes. Uh, the first maneuver is clearly in-plane dominated by orders of magnitude since this is a log-log plot, or a log plot. Um, so it's clearly an east-west maneuver. The second one clearly cross-track dominated, so clearly a north-south maneuver. And we can uh, also provide delta-v metrics on how large it is. Our delta-v metrics tend to be a lower bound on what actually happened because of our optimality constraints. The true maneuvers here were over four hours, but the observation gap was 22 hours, so it's essentially saying if you maneuvered over the course of 22 hours between this orbit and the next orbit, this is the lowest amount of uh, delta V you could use for a quadratic uh, cost function. Um, and this is just a sanity check to show that the estimator is working. This is uh, our estimates with respect to truth um, with a three sigma envelope. Even through the two maneuvers, we don't lose tracking. Uh, we're tracking on order of 10 meters. And as I said, I'd mention angles only. If I use angles only, I reduce tracking to uh, a kilometer, which is what you would expect for the level of data we're using. Um, but both maneuvers are detected in the same fashion in that you detect two, no false detections, and you get very similar delta V metrics on them. Uh, so with that, I conclude by saying what I was looking at here was uh, real-time automated estimation in dynamically mismodeled systems with non-cooperative data sparse observation while trying to obtain information on that mismodeling uh, with no a priori information on the mismodeling. So in terms of results, uh, the algorithm we have here is the adaptive nonlinear optimal control-based estimator, which is capable of real-time detection um, with a delayed compensation for uh, automated mismodeling compensation, uh, mismodeling reconstruction through our control estimates, and it processes measurements automatically and solves a nonlinear state and mismodeling estimation problem. So in terms of future work, we'd like to adjust the approach to multi-target tracking with uncorrelated measurements. So uh, a more general SSA approach in that here's a batch of measurements, here's a batch of targets, see which belongs to what and what the targets are doing. 
Uh, we'd also like to quantify the chance of false detections and misdetections by accounting for the coupling between the metrics since the metrics are based on the same pieces of information. Uh, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the work being sponsored by the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship um, and ask for any questions. <laughs> you ran to the mic. That's awesome, man. Go ahead. Um, and, and so the acceleration can always be below your threshold there, so it's always lighting. You just slowly ramp up your threshold, and, and it's like the frog getting boiled. <laughs> right. How do you do that? Thing? How do you deal with the frog getting boiled? Oh, uh, it's the question of our age. Um, so we have uh, previous papers that deal with that too. Basically, a maneuver starts, and then you get a measurement, and it's going through uh, a window of measurements. Uh, Generally, if your uncertainty is pretty high, that deterministic mismodeling needs to build up and then you compensate for it. So if your uncertainties are pretty high, you're not gonna be able to see you know, like a tiny acceleration when your uh, observation gap is 10 seconds, 100 seconds. Um, but you'll see it over the course of several measurements. Um, and generally, it's a pretty unbiased estimator in that it'll still give you a pretty good delta V metric on what happened, especially when the maneuver is going from time one to time two. So the trick really is setting that detection threshold appropriate to the case you're trying to treat, right? I mean, it's, it's right. I mean, uh, I mean, if your velocity uncertainty is high enough, you're not going to be able to see a very tiny delta V, yeah. but you'll see it occur over time. I guess, uh, go ahead. Just a very general question. Uh, now, you know, I was trying to draw a parallel with this work with the classical methods of trajectory optimization where, mm -hmm. you know, the endpoints have to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And in between, then you are looking at how your trajectory is deviating from your predetermined, uh, you know, your original. Uh, and um, I'm just wondering if you might comment as to how, what kind of constraints are released in order to take into account of uh, the work that you are doing or how it ties into some of the classical work? In terms of constraint, I mean, the problem is constrained to dynamics with uncertainty on those. In terms of, you have soft constraints due to the measurements, soft constraints due to the a priori information. Um, so uh, I'm not exactly sure your question beyond that. I may not be asking it very clearly, <laughs> but I was referring to the initial, the starting and the endpoint constraints because if, uh, you know, uh, the work uh, uh, frequently, if the initial and, and final are changed, then, uh, you know, your algorithm can provide you answers which can vary very quickly. It can, uh, so. Uh, I think we can talk offline about this, but in general, the control, the states are estimated simultaneously, so they move together. And I guess one last question is, have you thought about how to extend this to maybe uh, biased observations? Uh, so a biased observation will just appear as a mismodeling in it. Um, I've thought about it in terms of you can, we're only adjusting the assumed dynamic uncertainty. We can adjust the uh, measurement uncertainty and things like that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, for our next talk, we have uh, Dr. Mark Vincent. So Dr. Mark Vincent uh, got his education at the University of Toronto in engineering physics, PhD at the University of Texas in aerospace engineering. Uh, basically, this uh, gentleman uh, was uh, one of my professors at the University of Colorado, so I have lots of questions for him already. Uh, and and, and let's, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Vincent. Yeah, thanks, Mariba, for the 10 weeks of teaching. There was never a dull moment with you in the class. Pointer. Okay, uh, program manager Daddy gave the, Levy the uh, requirements on his daughter to have uh, some people pulling their hair out over on this side and some people smoking pipes and tweed jackets on this side. 
and a broken bridge in between. So we'll, the idea of the paper is to see how much of this bridge has been built. I think she did a pretty good job. I'll give her a raise. And uh, especially because the parents in the audience probably are familiar with Animal Jam, which is no PowerPoint. But before I get accused of uh, breaking any child labor laws, I should probably add my contribution to this. Uh, I'm going to start off with some simple things. Uh, for Constellation Flying, I'm referring to the A-Train. I think this has been presented in previous conferences. And if you have any questions about the A-Train specifically, and we have time at the end, I can uh, answer them in the, in the uh, answer, question and answer period. Going to get on to, uh, again, a simple idea for doing some maneuvers. Getting a little more complicated about what the timing is and what the nominal evolution of the probability of collision is, including uh, different tools, including my PC forecasting tool and how it compares to another one. Then I'm going to kind of backtrack and say, well, sometimes the results that we see in operations do not match any of the theory and we like to talk to the JSPOC and work with them and find out why. OK, the, there's two types of maneuvers that we're normally doing in the uh, A-Train. Uh, the DMUs, you can start up here. The drag brings you down. Dr. Kepler brings you backwards and then forwards. And then you have to do a DMU raise. And the, and the, segue here to the, uh, uh, the orbit debris mitigation is the fact that uh, this can push you out of your box. Of the six satellites in the A-Train, three of them do not want to do an orbit lower, so they have to do a risk mitigation maneuver in RMM upwards. In fact, our Japanese colleagues had to do a few upwards maneuvers, and they've been out the back of their control box for several months now. Luckily. Uh, the, these control boxes are separated by buffers from your, from your neighbors. And I also wanted to point out that you know, we were, had a presentation from the FAA this morning. Uh, at the A-Train altitude, 705 kilometer frozen orbits, sun synchronous orbits, uh, we are started up our self-policing. By You can independently fly in your control box. You're not supposed to leave your control box. If you leave, leave it and come back, it's OK but you're certainly not supposed to go into anybody else's control box, and though we have contingencies to when that happens. Uh, the other type of maneuvers, annually we do inclination maneuvers to counteract the lunar solar effect, which is increasing our inclination when we're at the 130 uh, ascending node time. And the only uh, relevance there to this is, uh, in some cases, quite often we do an early DMU, so you fly a smaller horseshoe because there's a normal a conjunction occurring. You can't do that in, in the inclination maneuver case uh, unless the thing's coming right at you. And the thing coming right at you is not a good case, as Matt Hayduke explained yesterday. So if it's coming obliquely at you, doing an inclination maneuver does not change the timing. So you don't really help matters there. And so you usually uh, have to do either an RMM or a combination maneuver, which uh, my satellite OCO2 actually did at the first maneuver this spring. Uh, this is a simple com concept. What hard body radius should you, should you use? The uh, probability of collision is proportional to the square of the combined hard body radius between the secondary and pr primary object. So some examples in the A train here. Whoops. How do you go backwards? There. Uh, this is Aqua. It's a large satellite, only has one solar array. So you can see by using this, they're being very conservative, especially if you consider that the uh, object itself might be coming parallel to the page here. OCO2 is a medium satellite, but it has solar arrays on both sides. CloudSat has the solar arrays parallel to the body. And when I say conservative here, I'm already biasing myself to say that the conservative means not getting hit by something. However, one of the themes of my paper is balancing the operational costs. And when I say operational costs, I just don't mean paying the people to 
do the maneuver design, the command generation, and the upload, not to mention pulling in half a dozen uh, managers to the go no go meeting on Friday evening. They usually happen on weekends, it turns out. Uh, that's, a, that's quite a bit of money, so the idea is try not to be too conservative for what you choose, but most people choose a conservative uh, hard body radius, in particular for, their, for themselves. Uh, for the secondary object, uh, our friends at CARA, uh, Lori's group, gave us the number 95 percentile is 1.5 meters and lower. This was confirmed by my friends at Kirkland Air Force Base who came up with 94%. That's a pretty good agreement. So that's the value that we use for most of our missions. Uh, however, there is a caveat to this. If CAR tells you four or five days in advance that you're having a conjunction and it is a rocket body, then you can ask CAR to increase the combined hard body radius up to, say, three or four meters, depending on if it's an intact, intact rubber, uh, rocket body. So moving on to something that's a little bit more controversial and a little bit more complicated, what are the thresholds that we're going to use here for, for the analysis? Uh, the, the driving requirement here is the one part in, ten, in, in a thousand of having a collision over the entire mission uh, imposed by NASA. However, there is a cumulative probability by not maneuvering for values that are below the threshold. I haven't convinced everybody about this, but if uh, you're not convinced, bring your wallet and some dice and we'll play some games here. So if you just use a simple um, binomial expansion and use this term right here is what you end up with for the cumulative probability and consider 10 conjunctions just under the threshold. This is just an example. Uh, that would imply that the, the threshold for your maneuver decision should be 1 in 10 to the minus 4. However, what you really should do is integrating over all the, the cases where you're not doing a maneuver. And one of my colleagues, again at Kirtland, has suggested that we mine the data and look at all the cases and see what the probability difference uh, has occurred because we have done maneuvers and haven't done maneuvers in a cumulative sense. So I think we, I should ask Barbara to we should get some funding and, and try and do that, and CAR is interested too. Uh, but the bottom line here is OCO2 and CloudSat have chosen this value 1 times 10 to minus 4 as their maneuver threshold, and our other colleagues in the A-Train are similar but not quite the same. Also there's other thresholds to consider. One is the uh, when do you start doing the planning. We orbital analysts love our jobs, and we usually tr start earlier than we really necessarily have to. But the value we sort of officially do is 1 times 10 to minus 5 for CO2 when we start planning the maneuver. And I put a little uh, note in there too. If the secondary is actually a maneuverable object, then you want it to pay even more attention. CARA actually highlights that in blue for us, just in case they might be doing a maneuver themselves. So we don't always have time to contact them, though. And then kind of a big subject is, well, what size of maneuver do you and what what post-maneuver PC is acceptable. You usually have lower values for that than your RMM threshold, and that's mainly due to execution error, something that's just now being sort of included in the covariance analysis. For OCO2, we go down two orders of magnitude, 10 to minus 6, but you know, if we have something coming at us with a 1 in 100 probability, we would accept 10 to minus 5. It's much better. And CAR suggests lower values than even the 10 to minus 6. Uh, and as we've heard numerous times in this conference, there's a lot of objects up there, and we're going to be using this, the space fence to measure even more. So the, the uh, post-maneuver conjunction assessment is pretty complicated, and I'll talk about later a little bit about the tools that have been developed to do this. But my opinion is that once you have these tools, then it brings up all kinds of new choices about doing maneuvers, and I explain that in the paper. Okay, for the orbital mechanics people, this is going to be pretty simple, but for people that aren't designing maneuvers, just wanted to show you the cases. If, if the secondary object is behind you and above you, and when I say behind 
or ahead. I'm not really, I'm talking about the time, the TCA. You can think of it in the plane of, of, the, of the direction that they're coming from. In that case, you do an orbit lower maneuver, which is sort of a win-win situation. You go further below and, and farther ahead. Uh, similarly, if the object is in front of you and below you, you can do an orbit raise. And when you do that, for a third of an orbit, you move this direction. And then again, thanks to Kepler, you move back and up. Though I also want to point out that when we first started worrying about this in the A train, there was sort of a choice of doing uh, a, a maneuver and using the long track effect accumulating over days or doing uh, a maneuver 180 degrees away from the where the conjunction occurs and using the radial separation, which is twice the semi-major axis change. And as, as the sort of the theme that you'll see late in later slides, it's better to wait longer. And if you wait longer, you have to use the radial uh, component as how you mitigate. And again, people that are familiar with the conjunction, this is just my version of, of I'll explain it for the people that aren't familiar with it. You have one object here and one object here. You have a missed distance direction in this in the conjunction plane and a missed and a, what I'll call the perpendicular distance in this direction. And to calculate the probability of colli collision, you're taking the bivariate distribution of where this particle, rather than being at the or origin, could be anywhere in two dimensions. And you're calculating what the probability is it's in this tube. So since the surface is the PDF of the, of the bivariate conjunction, you're calculating the volume inside this tube with a, the, the top of the, uh, the tube being the, the surface. And so this isn't in the paper. I just want to kind of set up the next slide. If you standardize, first of all, I want to talk about the bivariate normal distribution and the approximation I'll be making throughout the talk for plotting purposes only is that the, the two directions, the standard deviation is the same. If you have them different, it's harder to plot in a 2D plot. So if you assume those are the same, and then you standardize the, the missed distance to be one and vary what the, the standard deviation is, you find out you get this value one over square root of two is where the curve is the maximum. And that's, that's important. On this curve, I have to credit Sal Alfano in 2003 at the Big Sky Summer Conference, first presenting this. It's, it was kind of a landmark paper. Also, Matt Hayduke sent me a version of this. I couldn't paste it into my presentation to my JPL customers, so I created one on my own and got interested in the subject much more. But to orient you a little bit, this is the, uh, the logarithm of the probably a collision. Here, it's the ratio of that standard deviation, again, using the spherical approximation to the missed distance. So some people are very familiar, but I'll go over with why this is so important for the operators. Back here, when you're, you don't know really where you are, your PC is low. This is a controversial subject in its own right, and I'm not going to get into it, so I talk about the philosophy of it a little bit in the paper. But then as the, you get new, new tracking in, new, do new solutions, and your uncertainty decreases, you go up to this maximum value, which as I just showed you is at the one of the square root of two value. And then when you, after that, you find out where you are very accurately, then the PC drops rapidly. Now there's other several, there's a couple of caveats to this. One, as Francois did in his presentation and the, the short course, there's uncertainty in what your covariance is. So you're not quite sure where you are horizontally here. And the other important point, which leads into my PC forecasting tool, is that not only when you get new observations do you go in this direction because you're shrinking the covariance that you're ap from your, after your propagation, but you're also jumping tracks here. So the missed distance changes. However, the, the, I hypothesize that, the, that there is a probability distribution about you jumping the tracks, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, this slide's a little bit out of place. Uh, what it's really kind of showing is how many papers I read, trying, reading all the theory, and I wanted to kind of present, uh, point out that a lot of the academic effort has been down this path here, where you're, you're not linearizing the equations, you're using some sort of, rather than propagating all the, the points in the covariance matrix, either in a, 
uh, full factorial or Monte Carlo method, which is usually labor intensive or computer intensive, you use some of the points. Uh, sigma point and unsended is most famous. Um, Mariba can tell you about ensemble or uh, actually the entropy method. Brandon can tell you about the polynomial method. They're all sitting here. And Jason's also sitting over here. He can tell you about what Kalman Schmidt is. But anyway, I just wanted to say this is where the effort is. However, as, as Matt, as H has pointed out, uh, and I'm going to get to, in, in, oh, I should go back. The other point I wanted to make here, too, is that the, uh, the problem for the operators is this time right around here typically is between 12 and 36 hours before the, the time of closest approach. So it's where, where you're trying to make your decision, have your meetings, design your maneuvers. However, my manager customers freak out when they see this increasing like here, even though I tr tr keep showing them this figure. So I was going to say, so as this, this 24 to 36 hour time approaches, the, the error due to your propagation and the covariance becomes less important. So that's where you know, we should work with the academic people and, and figure out what the, where the effort should be placed. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the present tools. Uh, as we've heard, that you can use consider parameters or state process noise to account for the force modeling that's not in your, in your model. Uh, I'll use this screen. Uh, right now, uh, I'm helping one of my uh, colleagues implement a scaling of the covariance for the Earth observation missions, Aqua and Aura and Terra. And the other A-train missions are considering increasing the covariance because it's too small. Though, actually, OCO2 and Landsat 8 are the only two satellites that are actually giving the uh, covariance matrices to uh, CARA. Uh, you're familiar with what JSPOC delivers. They deliver their solution, ASW solution, where they're comparing their two covariances. But as, as most of you know, most big satellites know where they are better than the, the JSPOC does, so we provide them the data. Uh, the JSPOC does take into account some of the uncertainty in the along track modeling by uh, currently adding a constant scaling, and they're going to have a dynamic scaling implemented soon. Uh, CARA has a tool to take into account the uncertainty in the atmosphere due to solar flares. We heard that, all that yesterday. And both uh, CARA and SpaceNav have tools that handle the situation of multiple secondaries, which I talked about yesterday. SpaceNav is a private company, which leads to my next bold, is they also have a, a future PC tool. And the story here is that Matt Duncan and I were having happy hour the night before he was flying to this conference last year. And we found out that we've both been working on the same thing. Uh, a little bit different methods. He has a Monte Carlo analysis in it. This is where I'd like to point out my little pet peeve that people think that Monte Carlo is the, Carlo is the, is the golden standard and uses a lot of runs, where actually full factorial is more of a golden standard, and, but uses a lot more runs than Monte Carlo. That's why Monte Carlo is useful. So this is the important slide of my talk, and I see I'm running out of time here, but I'm going to go back from the bivariate to the univariate distribution. So instead of the, the, the tube, now it's going to be this blue area that you're calculating. This is at time zero. Again, this is the distribution at the time of closest approach. So now we're going to move to a future, future time, T1, where I'll keep the blue for reference. But now the, the missed distance has is, is, is decreased. The uncertainty has gone down, as we expected. In fact, the missed distance has changed so much that the probability of collision is increased. So this one line right here uh, explains how my uh, uh, spreadsheet tool that I used to do this. And the, and the big assumption is that delta has the same probability distribution function as the original MD0. So what you do is you take the, the probability of being in a bin where I bin all the values that, 
the misdistance could be at a future time, multiply it by the probability of collision according to that bin, count the cases that don't exceed the threshold, and that's your confidence level. So this is, this is the final result. Uh, try and uh, speed up here. Uh, again, using the circular uh, assumption, there's a standard deviation for now, and there's a standard de deviation for the future. So there's this diagonal curve means that this is where the future covariance is, is smaller. Uh, interesting pictures over here. But, uh, and the other two curves here, this is where your PC is already greater than your threshold. So the, the confidence level here is that things are going to be better at the next observation time. Here, they were good, very good to begin with because you're on the right-hand side of the final curve. Here, you're on the left-hand side of the final curve. But there's two caveats out here. Quickly, I just want to say the first caveat is this is, you have to know what this covariance will be in the future. There's two papers at the Vail conference a couple weeks ago about this. One is the, uh, oh, sorry, I thought it was going to be fast. Anyway, so you have to know that. And the other caveat is, so what the value is 70%, that doesn't really help you in operations. So I wanted to talk about the case where, uh, OK, sorry. Yeah, I understand. All right, let's read the paper. Yes. All right, so for our next speaker, uh, we have uh, Ryan Frim. He's an engineering manager at uh, Omatron, currently serves as a functional lead for flight safety on the NASA uh, FDSS 2 contract. Bachelor's in mechanical engineering, MS in aerospace from University of Maryland. He's been working a lot on these conjunction analysis and SSA problems. It's a very, very long bio, so I'm going to let you actually get up here and talk uh, in the interest of time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mariba. So Mark gave me about four minutes to get through all of this, so we'll, we'll see what we can do here. Um, it's after lunch, um, last day of the conference. Most people were snorkeling. I get that. Um, but I wanted to do one quick exercise. So by show of hands, how many people have hit reply all instead of reply? Okay, how many people received a notification from me over their conference mobile app? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Always talk to your children before you use mobile applications. Okay, what's, what's what here? Okay. Um, I know you all are intimately familiar with the CA problem, but I am going to go over it um, and a little, a little, give a little context so that way when I'm setting it up for the next part of this, which is how do we deal with a substantially larger catalog, um, some of that themes kind of, kind of resonate. Um, instead of just offering some concepts, we are going to do that, um, define some terms. Um, we are going to give a metric um, to talk about um, um, how some of this will actually be used operationally. We're going to talk about this metric both in terms of collision risk mitigation operations, i.e. maneuver planning, as well as the risk assessment piece of this, which is how you enter um, into that maneuver planning um, phase. Uh, they're kind of out of order here and how you would think about it. They're out of order in, in the charts, but I'll explain why we do that in a second. Um, offer some other ad operational considerations to, to um, to keep in mind um, when, when we move forward with this concept, um, maybe some advanced concepts, some basically a, a place to dump the things that we haven't figured out yet, and then how we're moving forward with some of this. Okay. Okay. So we've been at this conference for a few days now. So so um, and and a lot of people have been working in this field for you know ten or fifteen years. So. Um, I don't have to go into great detail, but more and more uh, mission stakeholders believe that uh, ornamental collisions are a real threat. We know that the JSBOC is detecting, tracking, and maintaining a high accuracy catalog. And more so, now they're even notifying operators saying, hey, there's a close approach, and here's how close it is to you. And there's even several documented cases of, of collisions in space. <clears throat> this problem is continuing to grow. We know that more objects are being launched. Um, there's a growing reliance on the space domain for all sorts of um, efforts. 
the, there's more and more objects being generated in space. Um, as you launch a vehicle, you're leaving your rocket bodies there. There are some um, explosions that take place, maybe even collisions, and maybe we'll see an uptick in that, um, that are forming additional small to large debris clouds. <clears throat> and then we're observing more and more objects in the space. We know that the JSPOC, or excuse me, the Air Force is um, um, fielding some new um, sensors and even some new uh, mission systems to, to um, to observe more objects. We even see the commercial sector getting more and more involved in here and, and proposing some ideas and has some um, offers to help with this challenge. So what that leaves us with is not only do we knew it was a risk, we know this continuing to grow, so we can no longer just kind of put our heads in the sand. And I think that's pretty well known uh, amongst the owner-operator com um, community, hence we have um, uh, great events like this. So this, this big sky theory, is no longer um, applicable, and most people have some sort of process or system in place to kind of help with this. So there's, everyone has their own process, everyone has their own tool. Well, some people have their own process, some people have their own tools. Those vary, they're nuanced, there's different pieces of this, but by and large, it comes down to three basic steps. What you're doing first is the, what we're calling at CARA the conjunction assessment effort where you're maintaining a catalog of these secondary objects here, the, the red ellipsoids. You know where your object is via either the, the JSPOC tracking it or you tracking it through cooperative measures. And then you're flying that trajectory out trying to identify if you're getting close to any of these other objects. That's step one. Step two then is, okay, well, now we've identified that these come in within some specified volume of each other. What's the likelihood that that's actually gonna be a collision? And therefore, is that what's the likelihood that I should take action on this to mitigate that? And then once we decide to do that, we enter in the third phase and planning the maneuver to get out of the way of the object. Okay, so that sounds really easy. Why isn't everyone, why isn't this problem solved? Why aren't we at a different conference besides being in Maui? So even when you have that, it's not easy. It disrupts mission operations, it takes time. Um, I don't know any flight observation teams that are just waiting for conjunctions to happen, so that's something to do. They have lots of other activities going on. <clears throat> it presents challenges for decision makers. There's organizations such as CARA that are trying to provide decision support to those decision makers. Here's our recommendation, here's why. But even that, um, it still presents challenges. This is, even for operators that have been doing this for 10 plus years, you know, we still, um, takes a lot of effort to, um, to decide whether or not what, what course of action we should take and then move forward to execute it. And like I just said, that pulls in a lot of resources, both on the owner operator side, um, if you have a, a, a support organization helping you with these decisions and your data provider, if that be the JSBOC or someone else. So just some reference statistics about the, the kind of problem right now. So for a satellite in a 700 sun sink orbit, which is where a lot of um, NASA's Earth observing satellites are, you know, we see a lot of close approach to notifications per month. That boils down to, oh, one to four high interest in when, when we're actually getting together, working these events, and usually results into a couple maneuvers that we actually execute per year. So that's today's catalog. What is this gonna be like when we have fence, space fence come along? We already seen estimates, there's a lot of people doing this where we're gonna get three to five times as many objects tracked and maintained in this catalog and therefore available for conjunction assessments. So I think this is gonna um, challenge the way that we're doing business even in, um, for organizations that have a robust concept in place for this. But this isn't a new problem. Um, we know that JSBOC's already making architectural investments. Um, we've heard a lot about that already this week. We know there's a lot of groups looking at the processing problem, um, whether it be technologies like GPU or clouds. Um, a lot of those technologies are finding applications in this um, mission area. We even see active debris removal coming to the, the forefront a little bit. Um, still mostly paper studies and things of that nature, but um, that used to be science fiction, and now, now we're, we're, there's whole workshops about that. Um, even at CARA, we're taking some small steps in how we organize and present this data so that it's at least manageable with the workloads that we already have. But, make sure I get the button right. Even if we have JMS, and even if we're doing it on a cloud, and even if we 
put a net around MVSAT, I don't think this is going to be enough. So what we're proposing here is um, kind of shifting the paradigm a little bit. Uh, right now, we just treat each conjunction as a discrete event, and we'll kind of walk through this in, a, in another slide. Um, but what I'm proposing here is that we actually treat all the, known, all the known conjunctions in some finite period of time as a single risk to the, the satellite. Um, we're kind of putting this term out there as finite CA, you know, cl um, collision risk management over a, a specific duration. Um, a lot of people, at least in LEO, are screening out seven days. Um, we're working on a five and a half to seven day um, span for, for identifying conjunctions and, and working with our owner operators. So over that total period, can I handle, treat all these risks as a single one? If we do that, we'll see that there's parts of this con ops that we can preserve, some that we can adapt, and maybe some that we scrap altogether. <clears throat> so I won't go too much into the math. All of this can, you may find in the paper. Uh, but the, I want to do um, set up the total probability collision metric and what we're doing with this. Um, Mark actually had this on his last um, chart, this formulation here. But what we're trying to do is if we assume that we have three, just for um, an example purposes, three events, um, conjunctions A, B, and C, we want the probability that any one of those occur. So you can fi follow this law of complements here. And we're, we are going to make the independence assumption. And then we're going to have a Monte Carlo example of how we've trying to figure out if that assumption is valid. But you get this equation, which is the um, product of all the um, event probabilities. If you, um, Mark talked about this a little bit, but if, if you look at this and not, don't subtract it from one, what you're getting is the probability of survivability. Since we're used to dealing with the 1 times 10 to the minus 3, 1 times 10 to the minus 4, we're going to leave it in this formulation so that those risks are kind of in the, at least in that aspect or in the same um, context is what we're used to dealing with. Okay, this is the, the same set of equations. Um, like I said, we do make the assumption um, moving from steps two to three that these are independent. You, so you remove any conditional probabilities, you still get some of these compound probabilities that account for the, the double counting. Um, but what I want to do is set up how we um, are attempting to test this assumption with a Monte Carlo approach. So Probably makes sense to you guys um, if we have uh, multiple conjunctions with multiple secondaries. We all probably think that, that we can treat those independently. That might get, that your intuition might get tested a little bit more if you're talking about um, repeating conjunctions. So the same primary and secondary just on, you know, orbit rev light or something like that. Um, even these, I, I guess, uh, if you look at higher order things, you can say, oh, okay, well, if, my sensor was tracking one secondary, maybe it's not tracking the other one, but you know, I'm, that's for someone else to study. Um, so we're gonna make this assumption. Like I said, we set up a Monte Carlo. What we chose was, um, we tried to get one of these, um, uh, the more trying cases with the, the repeating conjunction. We picked one where we had three conjunctions with the secondary, all greater than 10 to the minus four, so these are all fairly high risk events. We did a million trials where we, um, perturbed those orbits and flew them out. Um, and then we counted how many times they came within the hard body radius of the, of the combined hard body radius that we were using. So if we look at the table of the results, so these probabilities, these are all, all of these are from the, the Monte Carlo out, um, output. These are for the single event. So this was the probability, the number of, um, the number of iterations that we did in the Monte Carlo where we actually saw a missed distance less than the hard body radius, we count those up and divide by the number of trials. So that's the Monte Carlo one. Here's the compound term. So how many of these did we actually hit, have hits on several events? Now in, in um, the real world, that probably doesn't make sense. Even if we have a, if we have a collision on the conjunction A, even if the majority of the um, payload's still intact that was in a collision, there's probably enough energy in part of the orbit that it's changed, and that therefore you're not going to um, have a collision or very unlikely on the second one. But in the Monte Carlo sense, that trajectory is unchanged, so we can still count the number of them for, for these purposes. Um, here what we're doing is using um, one formulation where we're just adding up the um, the individual probabilities and the compound, and there you can see that from the Monte Carlo. Then we're using the formula. I said we made the assumptions, so we can just do the products of those probabilities. As you can see, those match pretty well. 
um, within an order of magnitude. So that's at least a favorable result so far. Um, there's still some more work that we want to do this. Again, this was one. It was one of the stressing situ um, cases, but it was only one. We did do lots of trials for that single one. Um, but what we'd like to do, again, is to get that formula where it's manageable in this using the 2D approximation for the PC. Um, there's a lot of there's a whole body of knowledge out there right now talking about Monte Carlo and maybe other techniques that are better than these analytic ones, um, whether it be 3D, 2D, or even 1D PC. But um, we know Monte Carlo takes a long time to run for a single event. So now we're talking about running that over a seven day period with a substantially larger catalog. You can see why we, we might like to use that formulation. So the results, um, we still need some more work to be done, but, but encouraging so far. Okay. So let's move forward um, from now, assuming that, that independence is true. So how can we use this, um, this metric in our collision risk management? Again, I'm going to talk about the oper uh, risk mitigation operations first and then move on to the risk assessment. Um, I'll explain why we're doing that now. In the maneuver planning, we've been doing, we've been considering the risk for other conjunctions for a long, long time. Um, the simplest form of this is when we plan a maneuver and then you model that in an ephemeris and then get that rescreened. You're checking for other conjunctions that might be induced by that maneuver and therefore um, we are taking into consideration other secondaries. We're doing that kind of on the back end. Um, so that's again why we even went to um, sort of a maneuver trade space for a single event was to move some of that to front end so we're reducing iterations and number of um, screens that have to take place. But We've been doing this um, implicitly, whether, whether we realize it or not. <clears throat> now, many groups have tools like this one. This is Kara's. Um, you know, we have one at NASA Goddard that we use for our missions. This is a, a, a trade space of the burn um, duration and timing, on, and the contours represent what that post maneuver um, probably was. Our first gen of this actually was just a single um, conjunction event, giving you the contours of that post maneuver probability. This one here. We're showing, again, this um, example with three repeating conjunctions. So this is the total probability of collision um, across all three of those. One nice feature in this that I'll mention is if we choose one of these post-maneuver PCs where we want to be one of these little wells that we plan a maneuver, it means that any of, the, any of the conjunctions we're mitigating to that level or better, which is a virtue of, of the way this is formulated. Okay. So since we already, that already exists, there's actually commercial tools available. Like I said, Kara has one. Um, I want to move on to how we might do this, oh boy, in uh, risk assessment. So um, right now, this is the situation we're in. Here's you right now, and we're looking at, um, if you're looking out in time, we have discrete events here. Um, hopefully you can read those from your seat. But there's a discrete probability, discrete event that I'm, I'm seeing, and what I'm doing is I'm watching it, and I'm, I'm trying to do is see if it gets up here. Is it getting close enough in time that I need to plan a maneuver? Am I stressing my timelines to be able to upload a maneuver? And is it high enough risk? These things change over time. We get new predictions. We're following the canonical behavior, all that kind of stuff that we've been talking about um, in previous papers. That's happening here. And typically, there's a single event, maybe a couple, that trigger us to go into that next phase. So what happens when we start looking at larger and larger catalogs? This is that same graph that I just showed. This is five times as many conjunctions. This is 10 times as many. Again, it's just, a sam uh, it's just an example to show what you're looking at. Uh, one of the interesting things is that when we talk about this probability of survival over a lifetime, if I didn't tell you what these time frames look like, this might be today's catalog over a year, or it might be the space fence catalog over seven days. So, that kind of helps put your mind in, in what this looks like. Um, but again, if we don't have something that we're convolving these, you get into this, okay, well, what's my first risk? When's the last one? What are next to each other? What's the most significant? So we need a better solution. One of the things I'm showing here is now this total probability of collision. This can be presented in two ways. One is just a numerical value. Okay, what is my total risk by convolving all these probabilities over that duration over which I'm convolving it? Or here I'm showing an accumulation of these things over time. So you can see um, each one of these are contributing to my total probability as we step forward in time. 
So you might ask yourself, well, which in this, the trigger event kind of goes away. You might say it's that guy because that puts me over some threshold. But if I wasn't convolving this probability, right here it would be lower. So we kind of got out of that framework of treating these as discrete events and moving forward. Um, some of the advantages of this, it's, it's a, little easy, a little easier to manage, right? It's a single risk. Now there's a lot of things going involved in there, um, a lot of things involved, there's a lot of moving parts and things like that. But there's also no inherent limitation. I can keep convolving probabilities all day long, although we'll talk about a practical limitation in a little bit. It does so by retaining the physical significance and what it does do is present this false sense of security if you just have lots of low risk events. So we see this all the time where we're flying through 10 to the minus 10, 9, 8 conjunctions. Well, if you get enough of those, that actually presents a pretty significant risk to your, um, to your satellite. So even if we have space events we're tracking and the, the accuracies are much better, even low, lots of low risk can convolve to a high risk. Um, let's see. Take a second to talk about quality and timing. Um, that's one aspect that troubles a lot, uh, a lot even now with the discrete event. Okay, how am I trusting the, the confidence, what confidence do I have on the data that's going into this? And we still have to deal with some timing aspects. There's ways to do this actually in the formulation if you want to weight it. Again, you're taking yourself out of this um, realistic um, or the physical meaning. Um, we try to do this actually with F value where we're reusing some um, qualitative factors what you lose, again, is the physical significance, but you do get, kind of retain this overall risk score. Um, this chart is talking about, and again, you can read in the paper, is that um, you can actually fold that into your threshold versus throwing in the computation. Um, some advanced concept, total PC saturation. Again, I mentioned you can convolve all these all day long, but at some point there's a practical limitation, and that's gonna present some real challenges to us when no matter what you do, it's always a high enough risk. Uh, total evaluation time, this was a way of, um, over this, this is that total PC threshold, and this is my accumulation. Can I count the periods of time that I'm over that threshold and do some sort of rudimentary metrics like that? Now we're, we're getting pretty abstract. Um, another thing is using collision avoidance as your routine maintenance, your orbit maintenance strategy. So allow these conjunction events to play into your orbit maintenance um, strategy versus against it. Um, your, your, your routine or drag makeup maneuver becomes your quick fire onboard one and your CA becomes your routine one. Um, so I'll leave this up here. I'm over time. Thank you. So for our last speaker, we have Professor Russell Boyce. Uh, he's the chair for space engineering at UNSW in Canberra where he leads the UNSW Canberra space research effort. Uh, he brings to this role a research approach developed through 25 years in the field of hypersonics, coupling computational experimental research with his flight testing, most recently via the Scram Space, Scramjet Flight Experiment Program. He is the chair of the Australian Academy of Sciences National Committee for Space and Radio Science, sits on the Executive Council of the Space Industry Association of Australia, and is an associate fellow of the AIAA, and uh, I've definitely had the, the honor of uh, being with him down there in Canberra, teaching him orbital mechanics class, so thank you. Thank you, Mariba. I'm gonna to talk to you about, um, well, I wanna give you a flavor of some of the uh, activity that's going on in Australia in addition to all of the ground-based sensing that you would have heard about in this conference. Let me acknowledge first, though, the uh, co-authors on this paper. All of those up to Sean Tuttle are colleagues of mine at the University of New South Wales campus in Canberra. Cormac Corr is at the Australian National University just down the road. Tom Scanlon is at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and Craig White is at the University of Glasgow. Mariba mentioned my background. There's one key point that I want to make about that which will shed some light on the rest of this talk. I've had the privilege of being able to conduct um, and lead teams doing research that combines the three things that you want to put together into aerospace research best practice, namely high fidelity physics-based simulations using supercomputers, ground-based experiments using uh, advanced diagnostics, and then taking all of that into the air and doing flight experiments 
Back in 2013, I was able to lead a team doing a scramjet flight experiment launched out of Norway. I'm now translating that research and I've been, um, I'm surrounded by some excellent people uh, gearing up to take that research approach into orbit. So UNSW Canberra Space has $10 million of university cash to build a space program. We're doing it in a variety of ways. We want to do in-orbit space science regularly. We want to, do, uh, to develop space-based and ground-based technologies. We want to do some hard science to tackle some really difficult questions. And we want to do that with partners. What does this mean for Australia? There's an, uh, there's an evolving space conversation in Australia. Australia traditionally didn't do space other than providing real estate for ground-based sensors. And we still do that. However, there's a growing awareness in Australia that we can and we need to do more. We need to do more so that we uh, maintain access to space-based da data and so that we can start to actually get involved and play a role in developing space-based technologies. What might that look like? At the moment, as I mentioned before, we provide real estate, so we use our strategic geographic advantage. Australia and its maritime areas that we have responsibility for, as well as Antarctic region, there's approximately one eighth of the planet there, and there are sensors from one end to the other, looking out into parts of the sky that most other folks in the world can't do. And so on that uh, geographic location, coming soon is the Space Surveillance Telescope that's currently sitting at White Sands, C-band radar. On the right there, uh, you can see the uh, laser ranging, laser tracking capabilities of EOS. And there's many other ground-based tools, many other ground-based sensors that are coming online that we are starting to understand can be used as space surveillance tools. For example, the uh, square kilometre array. There is an opportunity, however, to take up the challenge of providing some rigorous science and tackling some hard questions to underpin SSA. Some of those questions can be found in the continuing Kepler's Quest report to Air Force Space Command. For example, the fact that spacecraft are not cannonballs, they have complex shapes, they can be flexible, and they fly peculiar orbits, as we've heard many times in this conference. They have complex aerodynamics and solar radiation pressure effects, and of particular interest to me is the aerodynamics. Another key issue is the space weather. The space environment is not simply a static space environment, it's highly dynamic and there are very, very strong couplings that we know about but we don't model very closely. Understanding the way that the space environment behaves in its dynamic processes and being able to model that accurately, and being able to model accurately the way in which space objects interact with that complex space environment, that's, that's the hard challenge. So in Australia there is an effort building right at this moment, there's a, a proposal in with the Australian Research Council for a centre of excellence in near-Earth space physics. But basically the science, those scientific questions, the hard challenges to underpin SSA. There's many partners, some of them are represented in this room. We'll find out very soon if we proceed to full proposal. It doesn't really matter if we do or we don't. There are relationships established and there is work already gaining some steam to be able to tackle these questions. So to zoom in on the title of this talk, um, the, the focus of this talk, the approach that we're going to take to the astrodynamics part of those hard questions, in the same way that we did it in hypersonics, in the same way as, as these aerospace best practice, is to couple the high fidelity physics-based simulations, but this case, rarefied gas, much higher speed and higher altitude than in hypersonics cases. Benchmark quality ground-based experiments with advanced diagnostics, and then to bring those together and go into orbit to do rigorous benchmark quality flight experiments to validate the simulations and the understanding. With the numerical simulations, we are currently working with partners, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom, to couple direct simulation Monte Carlo methods with particle and cell methods so that we can do combined thermosphere and ionosphere aerodynamic simulations. I'll give you a couple of results in a moment, but the idea is to be able to build a database, a deep physical understanding 
of the way objects interact with given uh, environmental conditions, to build that database base for a, a variety of fundamental geometries, and then to use neural network trained surrogate models to build rapid prediction tools that capture the accuracy of the physics that's built into those models. We're working with other partners, for example, Los Alamos, who've recently come to the end of their impact project and, and developed a staggering amount of data um, of uh, 3D atmosphere simulations. And we're gonna tackle the challenge of converting such um, databases as well into neural network trained surrogate models. The step beyond that would be to couple those surrogate models and six off orbit propagation tools into high, accu high accuracy, very rapid physics based orbit prediction tools. I said I would give you a couple of results. We have now this coupled DSMC PIC code. The DSMC part came from the University of Strathclyde. It's built in the open foam environment and it's called DSMC Foam Strath. And we've built into that particle and cell methods and a way of approaching the mesh for this so that you, you build a mesh that is appropriate for the particle in cell, which means an extremely fine mesh. When you run it as a DSMC code, it takes that fine mesh and it throws cells together until you don't have too many. You've got just enough in just the right places that you have at least 20 particles in each cell. You can also run it as a standalone PIC code or you can run it hybrid. We need to validate that. And so here's some results validating the DSMC part of that code as is represented in this, this new hybrid code um, against a standard test case from University of Michigan using their Monaco code. And the results agree extremely well with some mesh sensitivity evident. And we've also taken some steps to validate the PIC, the particle in cell part of the code. This particular case is a, a Faraday probe that was actually experimentally tested downstream of a Hall effect thruster. And what we've got here is, uh, actually you can't see the, um, the legend in that, but the, the solid line is the PIC simulation. The dashed line is an analytical approach to simulate the plasma sheath around that Faraday probe. And the agreement is extremely good in the plasma sheath region. The PIC code actually picks up additional physics that the analytical approach does not further away from the probe. Hybrid DSMC PIC simulations are underway and validation is, is soon to begin. I mentioned experiments, ground-based experiments. We have a couple of thermal vacuum chambers and we have access to larger ones. And we're gonna build some, some experiments which are essentially satellite wind tunnel experiments. If you take a thermal vacuum chamber and you put an ion source in there, or a, a high energy, low density particle source, which could be, could be ions, could be neutral particles, uh, could be a combination. Then you can create the plume in which you could put fundamental objects and use advanced laser-based diagnostics and other diagnostics to essentially do satellite or space object aerodynamic tests. And we're, we're currently embarking on that process at the moment and intending to use the data from this to develop physical understanding to, va to validate the code, the simulations in certain conditions before extending to flight conditions. But at the end of the day, you have to go into, into flight if you want to get the real data. And so a large part of the $10 million that the university is investing is going into, has gone into building the team, building the partnerships, and, and starting to uh, develop and fly initially CubeSat-based flight experiments. So we're looking further down the track in about, let's say, five years' time to flying a small formation of CubeSats from which we deploy different aerodynamic shapes to use differential GPS between them that we have developed in our university to make precise measurements of the different uh, six off reactions of each of those shapes to the environment that they fly through together and to use that as validation data for the astrodynamic simulations. To get to that though, there's a number of things that we have to do. We need certain enablers. We've put together a flight team which when combined with the, the uh, faculty staff and research staff that are pulling together on, on UNSW Canberra space, we have uh, well over 50 years of combined space mission experience. And we have a full complement that's able to do these flights. We have some modest ground test facilities for 
spacecraft test and evaluation, and FLATSAT work, integration and assembly. And we have access to world-class facilities at the Australian National University. We have the Falcon Telescope, part of the global uh, network run out of US Air Force Academy. And eventually we'll be able to participate in tasking that entire network for ground-based optical surveillance to support the work. We have an operational ground station with UHF, VHF and S-band. And we're engaging currently with the Defence Science and Technology Group, which is the artist formerly known as DSTO, in a program called Buccaneer, which has two CubeSat missions. And this is the process through which we are getting our hands dirty with in-orbit experience. So the, 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 the first mission is a risk mitigation for the second, and the second is a, flying a HF radio receiver to make in-orbit calibration of the Jindalee over the horizon radar network operated from Australia from space. So first flight, um, hardware is, is uh, being assembled at the moment. We'll be delivered to launch service provider August next year, and we'll fly on the last Delta II mission in November 2016. Second flight, the main mission, uh, November 2017. I haven't put up the third flight that we have on the books because that applies to a separate conversation. Uh, but I mentioned before the, uh, the formation flight that we are looking to develop for the astrodynamics research. So that's the, that's the insight that I wanted to provide to you on what's happening in Australia to tackle hard questions to support space situational awareness. Let me just give you a couple of plugs now and then I'm done. Some of you would know that in 2017, the International Astronautical Congress is coming to Australia, to Adelaide. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some of you there, hopefully. Um, that will be a fantastic event. And currently, at the moment, Australia is uh, developing a bid for COSPAR, the COSPAR Scientific Assembly, the Committee for Space Research to be held in Sydney in 2020. So a space research follow-on to the IAC in 2017. And again, hopefully, we'll win that bid and I'll be able to welcome you to that part of Australia in 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I might have missed it in your intro, but do you have any high-performance computing resources at your disposal to support the modeling and sim research? Australia has a national asset called National Computational Infrastructure, which consists of a number of computers, the biggest of which is a, some 50,000 core machine, uh, which is just down the road from us. And we bid competitively for time on that machine, but each year we get plenty. Okay. Yep. That's Australian for yes. <laughs> So you talked about the satellite winter. Uh, I was just wondering if you might have any insight on the, on the satellite or space-related uh, uh, dimensionless numbers, like the Reynolds number, Prandtl number, Nusselt number, and so on. I can't give you specific insight other than to say that we are not going to be able to match the space conditions that we want until we have evolved that satellite wind tunnel and tinkered with a lot of things, and therefore we, we need to address those dimensionless parameters. Some of them might be the standard aerodynamic parameters, such as you've, you've mentioned, for example, Prandtl number, Reynolds number, et cetera. But there are going to be other dimensionless numbers as well, and even working out what those are is going to be part of the research problem. One more question. Oh. Um, so, you know, when we are doing, uh, like, you know, wind tunnels for aircraft, yep. it's the aircraft that's smaller. You know, you make a subscale for the aircraft. If you are looking at a CubeSat, you can put a full-size CubeSat, but you don't have full-size space around you. Yep. So, uh, uh, you know, do you have any thoughts on what you would do in order to really consider that type of inverted situation? That's an interesting aspect of the problem of scaling from laboratory to flight. Um, I don't have any insight to give you, but I would say that the objects that we would place in this satellite wind tunnel will be small 
and they will be canonical objects that we will use to study the physics as applies to, to them and, and their local situation to demonstrate that we can understand that physics and that the simulation capabilities can reproduce it. And from that we have a starting point to start to explore that scaling problem and to extrapolate to flight, whether that flight be a very, very large object or a very, very small object. Thank you.